Okay, so good evening and welcome to Jet. Oh, sorry, my apologies. Good evening and welcome uh, to General Council of August 10th. I first would like to begin uh, with any identification of any media on the line. Can you hear me? It's Donna from the Two Row Times. Thank you, Donna. Good evening. Hi. Uh, it's Victoria Gray from the Turtle Island News. Thank you as well, Victoria, and good evening. Are there any changes or deletions to the agenda? I have one, it's Melba. Oh. Okay, Melba, go ahead. Yeah, dental records uh, uh, for applicants for day schools. Thank you, everybody. Okay, thank you, uh, Melba. Is there is there anything further, uh, Michelle? Sorry, I, I, zoom. I mean, um, can I move Amy Miller to the open? Sorry, I'm moving, shifting. You're, you're moving Amy Miller into the open session. Is that your request? Yes, I, I've spoken to her, so she's uh, she's ready. Okay, let me just switch it over and pull up the in camera. Okay. So we'll add her to the, uh, would be after this item C of the CBTF uh, team presentation. Mark, it's Audrey. Sorry, Audrey, question, comment? Is that, is it, is it a question, does it have to be a motion by council in order to move somebody from closed to open? So it's an agenda item that was placed in by a counselor. It was placed in camera. Why is it not? Why is it being brought up now? It should have been brought up earlier when we got the agenda. Yeah, that that's my question, Michelle. Is there like is there a reason? I have no idea why it went in camera. I I Amy talked to Shirley. I don't know. So when I looked at the agenda today, I asked her why are you in camera, and she said she can be in open. Okay, my apologies. I see Shirley has her hand up. Shirley, can you help us clarify? You requested to be in house. I said right. that with the camera. Amy oh. requested to be in house, which I assume that it meant to be in camera. Okay, so really it was just a misunderstanding from, from communications, is what it sounds like. So, Michelle, you've confirmed that then Amy's okay with having it in the open session. Yep. Okay, so there doesn't need to be a motion. It's just a misunderstanding on the administration side. It should have already been placed on the open session to begin with. So we'll add that item under after item C on the delegations and presentations. Are there anything further in relation to the agenda? Seeing or hearing none, can I then get a motion to adopt the agenda of August 10, moved by Sherry Lynn, second by Michelle. Are there any further questions or comments? <laughs> Seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motions carried. We do have a number of delegations joining us this evening. Uh, the first delegation that we have on our agenda is Janice Montour, uh, the director of the Woodland Cultural Center. Uh, is Janice, uh, I see Melanie and Trudy on the line. Uh, there, uh, there is recommendation 4A1 on your agendas, which reads that the Six Nations of the Grand River Elected Council provide a council resolution supporting the Woodland Cultural Center uh, and Mohawk Institute Residential School phase three of the physical restoration to the building and adjacent to site improvements. So there is a recommendation under this. I'm sure among Melanie and Trudy are here to speak further to it. So uh, with that being said, I'll pass the floor to uh, my guessing Trudy to start. Go ahead, Melanie. I'm, I'm more here to just support Melanie. She knows about the, the okay, briefing note. Okay, okay, perfect. Thank you for that, Trudy. Good evening, Melanie. The floor is yours. Good evening, everyone. Um, uh, Janice just sends her regrets and asked uh, me to present to you this evening. Um, as you are aware, um, we're, because of the big federal provincial announcement, I think two weeks ago, the Woodland Center was awarded the infrastructure money that we applied for um, 
close to two years ago to finish the phase three of the physical restoration, which is um, the, the physical restoration items to be completed are listed. It's mainly to do with the masonry on the exterior, which is crumbling, the replacement of windows, um, some accessibility features, including an elevator. Um, the federal government has asked for this uh, resolution from council um, now that the funds have been awarded to support uh, to fi finish the um, final transfer payment agreement. So if anyone has any questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Melanie. Uh, questions, comments, Audrey? Yeah, so I just wanted to make, it, make that a motion, Mark. Okay, thank you, uh, Audrey. There's a mover to the motion, recommendation 4A1. Is there a seconder? I'll second mark it, Hazel. Okay, thank you, Hazel. Second by Hazel. Are there any further questions or comments? Seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motions carried. Uh, motion to waive second reading. I wave. Moved by Audrey Seconder. Is there a seconder for second reading? Uh, Helen, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing on motions carried. Okay, Melanie and Trudy, is there anything further on your end? Thank you very much, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Now uh, have a good evening. Okay, Council, that now leads us into our second delegation, uh, which again is on your agendas. Mr. Cam Cameron uh, is joining us this evening in relation to the Indian Day School implementation. Uh, there is again uh, a recommendation, but again, it's just as information, so I don't necessarily think we need to move necessarily. This is more for information purposes. Correct me if I'm wrong. Good evening, Cam. Thanks for having us. Always good to reach out to the community and give a little status update at the same time. So There's I do have my colleague, Alyssa, with me, Clarity Spence. She's also on the Indian Day School team. So Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Cam and Alyssa, for joining us this evening. I'm sure there, again, uh, are a number of question, questions within community about, uh, you know, the status and, and updates and so forth. Uh, so we're, we're glad to have you and looking forward to this update. The floor okay. is yours. Thank you. Thanks. So for your members to know, thus far, uh, Deloitte, the claims administrator, who is an independent third party appointed by the federal court, they're the ones who review the claims. They've received about 119,000 claims already. Um, that's a significant number to give everyone an idea. Going in, we estimated the class size right across Canada to be about 120,000 to 140. So claims are just trickling in at this point, a few hundred a week. Um, the bulk of claimants have already filed. Of those, about 72% have already been paid their compensation, and the rest are still in the queue. So 72% of the 100, and, you know, what were we looking at? About 84,000 people have been paid out so far, um, have received their compensation. Um, there are a number of people who have taken the reconsideration route, but before we talk about reconsideration, that's when you're leveled down. I should note, which is not publicly out there, although it might be now because it's been reported, <laughs> uh, about 18% of claimants that have filed and been paid so far have actually been leveled up. They've received more compensation than they asked for. That doesn't hit the social media and people don't talk about um, receiving larger compensation than they asked for, but that's a statistic that is true. And the inverse is also true. About 19% of claimants have been, that have been paid out have been leveled down. So before you accept a, a leveling down assessment, so Deloitte will look at you and put you into a box, one through five. Before you accept a leveling down, you have an opportunity to ask for a reconsideration. A reconsideration, so if you ask for a level three, for example, it's 150,000 compensation, and they come back and say, oh, we think you're level one, 10,000. Big difference. So you have 120 days to put forth more information to show why you fall into that little box. You know, in class actions, people like to refer to it as rough justice. 
we as our team don't see it as rough justice, really. It's rough compensation. Justice is off to the side. I don't think we get there. This is just compensation. I don't think healing comes from it either. It, this is just about compensation at this point. I think healing can come after or through the processes that this might help you bring about closure. So of those that are seeking reconsideration, so let's say you file the level three mark and then you get back a level one. You contact us because you didn't do so for the first time, let's say. And then we'll look at it and you actually might qualify for level four or five. We'll look at it and say, you know what? You forgot to mention this. So we'll help you package up your reconsideration narrative and refile it and ask for perhaps even more than you initially filed for. At the same time, we might look at it and say, really level two if you put this in. And we are so far, success rates about 80% um, are the numbers coming back. When I say 80% success rate, what I mean is from the initial assessment. So if Deloitte came back, Mark, and gave you a level one, and you put in a reconsideration and it, and it comes out as a level two, we see that as a success because it's higher than initial assessment, even though you asked for a level three. You might also get a level four or five. Every fact's different. Every claimant's different. So success is actually quite high in reconsiderations, which is positive. Not everyone's happy at that point either, though. And now we've entered the phase where people are now going to the independent assessor and asking for an appeal to her. And she's, again, been court appointed. And I think she has maybe 70 cases now in front of her. A handful of decisions might have been rendered. Where our focus on, as class counsel at this point, is location of abuse. Because Deloitte so far, let's say it's a sexual abuse, and I don't want to bring up trouble because of topics, that took place off school off school property, they're not compensating for that. We take a very different position on that and say, um, damn right, that teacher was an employee of the, of the school, they're in a position of power and authority. And if they did something at your house off school property, getting extra tutoring, that should be compensated. Um, so those are the matters we're really pushing claimants to go all the way to the independent assessor on because we think we're gonna have success there. Um, and I, I guess that's really the major touch point right now, what we're at. At this time, though, claims are still moving in. Argyle um, Communications, Inc., for those that don't know, they've been appointed last summer to assist claimants filling claim forms. So if your community, and I don't know if we've reached out to you yet or if you reached out to them, but if they wanted somebody to go on site in your community to help people fill in claim forms, that's their role. They will do it. We as lawyers, class counsel, are on standby, and they'll contact us virtually and we'll jump in in the middle of a call and advise them what we think the levels are, what part of their narrative needs to be fleshed out further. So we're still there, but virtually because of COVID. Uh, but Argyle is set up um, as a communications company to go in and do that. I mean, we're lawyers. We're not the best people for communications and publicizing things. That's not our niche. Um, so they're appointed by the court to do so. So that's some background high level numbers. We don't know anything specific, community by community. I know we've had requests from others saying how many people from our community have applied. We don't know. We don't have access to specific claims. Deloitte has their own system. We don't know what, how many members from communities have filed. Um, I don't even know if Deloitte's even aggregating that information because some people might put it, some people might not. It's not essential to file a claim. Um, so we don't know your community statistics. Although we know based on the years that the schools were open at Six Nations that you're going to have a lot. You may be in the largest uh, community. Any questions for us? So happy to answer them. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Kim, uh, for, for providing that, that update. Uh, there are no, a number of questions. Uh, so I will just really quickly before, there's a question coming from community. Can anyone that, that only applied for the minimum, which was the $10,000, apply for more? There were a lot of people that weren't aware of the ability to apply for higher amounts. But I think also in addition to that, with with the you know the unfortunate news of you know the residential schools and the recovering our children, I've also heard from from some people who said you know I wasn't prepared to share um, you know at that time, but I'm prepared to share more now in a sense. So I know there's there's a number of other examples uh, to that, uh, but is that part of or what can be done in those types of situations or scenarios? Yeah, so in a scenario where somebody's filed a level one claim and they didn't put in a narrative and they received, you know, the 10,000 compensation, you know, based on the rules and the settlement agreement, as of today, it's done. 
Um, it's a final settlement agreement. It's not open for renegotiation. A motion was filed with the court by third party legal counsel asking to be able to reopen it, to, to look to appeal level one decisions. Um, my personal opinion, that's providing false hope to claimants. I anticipate the judge will come back and give a decision that, no, you can't do it. This was discussed before. It's not an open dialogue on um, disclosure. The reason why it's done by writing is that you can do it at home in your own time. Um, unlike you know the residential school system where you had to go perhaps travel to Toronto, give testimony and be cross-examined with a you know Canada legal counsel in front of you doubting the authentic authenticity of your statement. Here it's all done by writing and it's good faith. And if you've not put in a written statement of what happened, and you know you only put in for level one, there's no appeal mechanism. Right now, the settlement agreement's not designed for that, for this size of a class. However, as I mentioned earlier, if you put in for level two and you wrote something uh, and they assessed you at a level one, you do have an opportunity to add an additional narrative, to put in more information. But if you got paid what you asked for, then it's done. Like you signed it, you submitted it. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's the way the system is set up. Hey, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kim, for, for your response. I want to shift over now to uh, counselors. I see Hazel and then over to Sherry Lynn. And sorry, I believe Alyssa had her hand up as raised as well. Uh, so I'll go over to Hazel. Yes, I just would like to know for all schools who previously were deemed to be federal and they took on their own education, the children who were attending those schools for any time frame, frame while the school is still under federal, do they have a chance to apply for this day school funding? So to clarify, are you speaking of the state claims or do you mean the- No, 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 I'm talking about any school. I'll give you an example, like Mississauga Please. of the Credit, they were initially like a federal school but they took on their own education. I'm not sure what year that was. So any child who attended there before they took on the education, shouldn't they be eligible to apply and get this day school money? Yeah, so I would refer to Schedule K of the claim form, and that Schedule K is the list of schools and dates. So those are the eligible schools and the dates. I think in Six Nations, there's a slight exception to it, because typically, let's say it was from, make up some dates here, 1960 to 1995, um, and I'm giving a late date because of Six Nations. 95 doesn't mean necessarily that the band took it over. I think that was the case for Six Nations. I think they offered it to Six Nations for, the, for them to take it over, and then the control and management still stayed with the federal government, and the, what the government says, well, we offered it away for it to, to leave our control. Therefore, that's the date that's going to be provided. The fact that the band didn't take it on, they're saying that's not our problem. So it's whatever the dates are in Schedule K. The Six Nations is a little bit different uh, because I know there was an offer for the community to take over control of the school. And I don't know about Ms. Sagas of the credit. Um, I'd have to look into the background. Maybe they fall into the same scenario. But regardless, Schedule K is a closed schedule, the list of schools and dates. So if somebody attended a school on that list during those dates, even for one day, they'd be eligible under this class action. But it has to be okay. on, that, on that list. Well, um, I know some people that applied for it who did get in a one day in that Mississauga credit school before it changed over to um, its own education system and were denied the claim. I see, uh, I, see Alyssa, I see Alyssa yeah. has her, Alyssa, did you have a further uh, additional comments? Yes, yeah, so I think, so I pulled up um, what Cam keeps talking about, Schedule K. It's a document essentially that lists all the 700 federal day schools that are eligible under this class action. You can find that, that list of schools on our website, indiandayschools.com. And it's called Schedule K because it's an attachment to the settlement agreement. 
New credit, um, there's two schools that were on new credit reserve, as an example. There's new credit, um, which was also called, so each school has an official federal day school name. So that's also important because on that list of each school, each school has a, 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 an official federal name. That name is the one that must be put on to the claim form. And the claims administrator is only going to be looking at those official names. So it's important to match that. That's the first piece. The second oh, thing is okay. that for new credit um, reserve, there was two schools. The first school was called just new credit. It was also known right. as Mississauga New Credit School. And that school was ran by the federal government from 1868. And then it either closed or it transferred control to this to someone else on September 1st, 1994. So that is the specific period in, in which the federal government had control and management of that school. There was another school in uh, on New Credit Reserve. It says new the official name is called New Credit Central. It's also known as New Credit Number Five. And that school was only open for about less than two years. It was actually open from September 1st, 1958 until June 30th, 1960. So after that point, we don't know what happened. Um, you know, the band could have taken over, but if someone had attended one of those schools within those period of time, even for one day, they are eligible for at least the, the level one. So in or yeah. each school is different, right? Each school has a different yeah. um, period in which it was ran by the federal government. And so you got to look at that schedule K. Okay? But either way, if they got a letter back and it says that they, you know, something was wrong with their claim or they weren't eligible, they can always give us a call and we can walk them through that letter yeah. to indicate and explain to them why what's going on with their claim. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you, Alyssa. I do have a question. And I, Sherry Lynn also has her a question. Um, yes. Can you update us on the um, the email scam that's going around? Because yeah. I've been getting a lot of community members um, printing it off and showing me and the number to call. Where's mm -hmm. that at? Yeah. So our role um, is not to police other lawyers um, and what other law firms are doing. So what we have done is we've brought that to the attention of the federal government, because our argument is you have a fiduciary duty to Indigenous people across this country. And they had the same thing happen in IRS. So they ought to have sent them off letters or communications stating you cannot be doing this and putting it out there. Uh, I don't know where what the government is doing, but as us as legal counsel, we're not the police and we don't go after other lawyers and tell them not to do X, Y, or Z. But we do report it when it's brought to our attention to the government of Canada so that they would deal with it. I anticipate, I, I think I know the one you're speaking of, is that that, and, and we've called it, and it's an answering service, is that they, you know, at worst, it's fraudulent, complete fraudulent. They're taking down personal information. They'll contact you later on and try and get some money off of you. At best, they're part of that motion of the people behind it trying to appeal level one claims that recently filed. That's the best case scenario that they are acting in that manner. Worst case, it's it's something rather you know, concerning. <laughs> I see uh, so, Sherry Lynn has a yeah, follow up, a, and then yeah, over a, to uh, Wendy. Yeah, just a follow up. So you guys haven't sent any emails out regarding that, right? Just to let the community know. Regarding um, like the statement, the statements that that these emails. Um, scams are that if you did level one, call us and we'll help you to get level. Oh, no, higher. we no, we didn't send any of those out. What okay, we've done is when people ask us, such as yourself, we tell them exactly what I've said. So we'll put that in an email to an individual that reaches out and say, at worst, it's this, at best, it's this. Um, but it is not true. And it's, it I, is a I, I think it's also other law firms too, right, that are trying to take advantage of community members for saying that they can assist <laughs> in 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 uh, you know in getting them more money when all reality you're saying that that's within the agreement itself, so it's said and done. So what what other lawyer other than other than going to the settler who was what, what Deloitte who's you know negotiated that on that behalf, 
it doesn't make any sense. So it's almost like, you know, watching out for or putting community on notice on other legal firms that are also reaching out to individual members, you know, saying this message that they can assist them with this. Uh, yes. Wendy? <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you for the information. I, I would think, though, to your response that you are not the, you know, the lawyer police. I, I appreciate that. However, I would think that your firm would be willing to take on the onus as well to provide clarity and information out to the communities. This is a huge contract that your firm has with a huge price tag to it. So providing that clarification and as you get questions coming in, maybe putting communication out to communities to say, we did not send this, this is not accurate. We suggest you do whatever process. I mean, that's what law societies are for and you know that very well, depending which province that they're in. So, you know, to do a response that you're not the law police I mean, there are things that you can do as a law firm doing this very important work. And I think many communities look to you to provide that clarification and that communication back. Yeah, and I completely agree. We do have a communications policy as a law firm is that we do not respond to third party websites. So if somebody posted that on our Facebook website saying that you can appeal level one claims, we would respond to it and our team would take care of it. What we don't do, and this is where it comes from, is this is based on a third party website on Facebook, and there's lots of false information out there. We monitor it, but we don't respond to it because it creates a big noise vacuum and we get sucked in. This is one piece or one example that's creating a lot of noise, but it's not the only piece of false information that's out there. There's lots. So we can't respond to everything. That being said, once this motion and decision comes out, we will certainly put that up on our website saying, this is what has come out. There's absolutely no level ones, but we're going to wait until that decision's rendered. Just, uh, sorry, uh, Wendy, do you have a follow-up question? And I, I do. And taking on this file and dealing with day schools, especially coming, you know, after Indian residential school and the horrors that went on with the law firms and lawyers through that, I would hope that you would take you being the law firm would take a little bit more action and you know think within the circle and have some strategy around that to help inform and help provide that clarity so that you know first nations people are not getting scammed through this process this is huge i mean if right now you have an elected councillor who is saying there are paper documents being circulated circulated stating this you know, I would think there's some obligation to communicate that's inaccurate information. You know, th there's got to be something in there. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Wendy, for your comments. And, uh, you know, I think that's part of mine in terms of my follow-up question that I had in terms of community assistance. So we did have, I believe, Deloitte into communities uh, that assisted members uh, during this uh, time period of, uh, you know, from like a, an all day where they came in do you still continue to do or offer those types of assistance to communities? No, so what you're referring to is Argyle. They would have been the ones that were in your community, okay. not Deloitte. Um, so Argyle's doing it, we are not doing it. Well, how we're directly like, we were part of that process because they will call us in to provide legal services, but filling in one's name, and address, et cetera, on the claim form. It's an administrative I, person. I think, yeah, I think even further to that, but even to, to Wendy's comments, it might even be even beneficial to say, well, which, which law firms are doing what? Because mm -hmm. it's broken down in multiple sectors, right? So I think that's also part of confusion as well, is like, you know, when you're looking to that piece, uh, you know, well, Deloitte did that piece, and then over Gowlings did this piece. And I think maybe that's also part of, you know, points of clarification that community assistance can also need the other question that maybe not be for you that I had, or maybe it's for another, is there, I know there was discussion in relation to COVID and everything else and already, you know, the barriers that have been had on people and members and so forth. Uh, there was discussion on the extension of the deadline date of July, 2022. Do you know if there's a status update in terms of where those discussions are? Yeah, so with respect to the extension requests and certainly they have come in from communities, there. Are the, the claims process will not be extended at this time. Doesn't mean it won't be. 
because there's already an extension built into the system. So an extension can be asked for six months from the end of term to file. So July 13th, 2022 is the end. So someone can file for an extension request six months before that. Deloitte does not have the ability to provide a, the claims administrator to say yes or no. How the settlement agreement is drafted, it's exceptions committee. So let's say, Mark, you were late filing, you needed more time for an estate claim. I'm giving an example, a good reason why you know estates take a little bit longer. Uh, and you wanted to ask for an extension. You couldn't do so until six months prior, but Deloitte can't even make that decision. It has to go to the exceptions committee to do so. And it's, as far as I know, as of today, and this has been a topic that we've had with Canada and Deloitte, there's no foreseeable extension beyond what's already in place, the extra six months. Um, as I noted earlier on, almost 119,000 claimants have already filed out of a class size estimated to be 120 to 140. And if, it's any, if residential schools and even 60 scoop was, it leads as an example, it's really busy in the beginning, it tapers off, and that's where we are right now. And right near the end, it, it, it bounces right mm -hmm. back up. And because we knew that, that's why we have the six month extension program already put in place. So I, because of COVID, I understand what the arguments are, there should be more time allowed, but the numbers bear fruit that lots of people have applied. There's already an extension process in place. Yeah, um, see, that doesn't mean it won't change later on. Well, and I think that's where we have to get, in a sense, a little creative in terms of leading up to that deadline date. You know, that's where further support's going to be needed, like you say, at those peak times that you know at the deadline date that everyone's going to be rushing to get them in. I think that's the other piece is, you know, do communities and members know exactly when this date deadline date is? And should, you know, the, the support to the uh, negotiations be more supported in communities to actually get members help in filling these out mm -hmm. into the standard so it doesn't have to go back and forth uh, you know a number of times I think those are some of the ways that we I, and maybe this isn't a conversation again with your law firm or, or the others but I think we have to get creative in a sense of making sure that everyone who's entitled to this settlement has the opportunity to make sure that their application is filled out in in successfully being able to be accepted I think that's another piece and where we have to get creative in doing this work. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. And I think in part that's why Argyle was brought in to do so. They weren't appointed at the outset. We were already seven, eight, nine, eight months right, into the process when I realized we need to get more people out there in the communities and structuring this and organizing it because we're lawyers, we're not a communications company in doing this. So it's a weakness for us. So they were appointed to, brought, to be brought in to help. I should say we still help people. We just have our 1-800 number. We'll do it on the phone with people and send them the claim forms and have them sign everything. We can do it virtually. We're just not in the community. That's where our dog comes in with their communications team. I would Listen. also just, I would just add to Cam's point is that Argyle is in the communities. They're helping with actual filling out the form and being there with the claimant. And we can communicate them to them that you know there's more urgency to have you know them out further to the communities what we've been doing like cam had mentioned is is not necessarily just um a 1-800 connection but they've also been working with us so for instance right now they're in a community and they're actually physically there now that they're able to and they have a connection to us and, and we get on a Zoom call with their the claims administrator or claims assistant and the claimant right there. So we have a video call with them and we provide them legal advice. And so Argyle, them helping out on the ground, um, we can communicate with them that there is some more urgency and, and wishes for people to, to be, for them to be out in the communities more. Okay, great, thank you for that. Okay, uh, well, thank you. Is there any further questions or comments for Cam or Alyssa? Uh, it's Melba. I may as well deal with that, what was on the agenda. And oh, what I asked right. counsel, it's Melba. Yeah, on the agenda. What, what do you do with uh, situations that uh, they cannot find their records? And in this case, it's dental records at Six Nations where it was told today to one of the uh, people that are, are struggling with this, they lost the records. There is no records. So I have two people that are struggling with that. 
and your office is asking for the dental records in order to finalize the application. Mm. Well, yeah, you don't need dental records. You don't even need school records. You can just fill out part six of the claim form where you're testing everything in there is true. Lots of people don't have dental records, school records, things get lost or don't exist. So there's no reason to produce any official record. The things that we would recommend people would claim is if they're claiming that they have mental long-term impairment that they can seek counseling today and receive a record today, tomorrow, some point in the future, because that really helps um, to make that claim. But with respect to dental records, you don't need them. Just sign part six. Could I ask okay, a question, well, they, Mark? They, they, they weren't aware of that at all. They've been told to get their dental records. No. You, you can clarify that for them or have them contact me directly. Um, yeah, it's not needed. Okay, they do you need to fill out part six of the claim form. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Melba. Thank you, Cam. Uh, Hazel? Yeah, I, further to Melba's question, I have a um, situation similar to that whereby somebody attended at the uh, dental clinic in Schwiegen and an incident happened there and um, she's supposed to find the dental dates that that occurred. Like, where on earth would you even look? Because it's almost like the records are so sparse there's a few here, a few there, and everybody's looking for like a needle in a haystack yeah. um, for their records, and it's totally impossible. Question is, so if she puts in there, uh, fills out that question six, then that should be sufficient. Mm -hmm. Yes, but let me add a point about dental claims. So dental abuse or harm was a matter that we had lots of back and forth with Canada and Deloitte on. And was it going to be covered at all? It's not on the claim form. It's not in the list one through five. It was not covered under Indian residential school. So after much research that went back and forth on it, we won the day, I guess. And dental claims will be accepted and compensated for and to give everyone on this call a rough idea. Generally, it comes out as a level two. Our analogy is it's analogous to a broken bone because that's covered in level two. It says it quite clearly. Um, Deloitte um, made a decision that didn't disagree with us, which is great. Uh, Canada did not uh, offer an opinion on it, as you can imagine. Um, and IRS would be a fine example of why. Um, but the point of, you know, let's say them extracting teeth is that it depends when. Right, so in roughly, depends where you're in the country, but I'll go to ballpark it, and Deloitte won't give you a fixed date either. Ballpark it about 1970. There was a time where it was normal to pull out teeth without drugs or anesthetics. And historically, you go way back when, you used to go to the barbershop, get your hair cut, and they'd pull out teeth. Slowly, the dental system started to improve upon itself, but it used to be more dangerous to receive drugs or whatever, laughing gas, and you might have a better chance of dying. So at some point, it started to become normal and safe to use anesthetics while receiving a dental procedure. So if you received, let's say, your teeth were pulled out in the 50s or 60s, you won't receive compensation for it because it goes to quality of care. And they say, well, that was normal practice on, off reserve. That's what happened. Whereas in about 1970, again, can't be fixed on the date. Is it 68? Is it 72? If you did not receive drugs, you should certainly put that in your narrative. Say, we do not receive any pain medication, and this happened to be in 1971, failing which it may not be covered. That's just some detail on dental claims since it was the second question on that particular abuse or harm. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Cam. I see uh, Wendy had their, her hand up, and then Michelle, and it looks like we will look to wrap up this presentation right after Michelle's comments. Over to you, Wendy. Yeah, and two comments. Oh, my apologies. Uh, Hazel as well. Yeah, two comments. Mark, maybe maybe it's timely as we're getting to, you know, it's been a year or, so or more, so maybe it's timely to have another, uh, as best as we can, some sort of community uh, meeting where we go through how to complete the forms. Perhaps Goldings can send their people in again to go through all of those steps 
you know, whether it's a level one, if it's a level two, three, four, five, or six, um, even with deceased persons to go through all of those steps and go through it because, you know, it, it's been a long time since I think people have gone through it and to understand how to complete the forms, what the narrative means. You know, if you don't have the records, you can still move forward with the narrative and so on and so forth so that it's very clear because it may be an obstacle for some people filling out and completing them. Um, so making that suggestion. And the second one, I guess, to Cam, you know, when you go on about the dental records and say what was acceptable and what wasn't acceptable, I would caution you about the trauma that many people, certainly in our community, have faced through residential schools and the day school. And it's not something to be taken lightly. Um, so a lot of those things are triggers being talked about and, and things like that. So, you know, seeing that it's, you know, it was okay not to have any type of treatment and getting dental work done and things like that. So just a caution and maybe some ongoing training about the traumas of residential school moving forward with the language that you're using. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Wendy, for your comments as well. Looking to that suggestion, definitely. I know it was, uh, it was well received in our community uh, last time we had that. So we'll definitely look to set that up again, especially as we now uh, shift in hopefully better days of COVID. Uh, Michelle. So I was going to make the another solution just like Wendy did. So I don't have to say, I, I don't actually have much to say except that I feel like, again, I mean, I thought Gullings was going to support us and it feels like we have to advocate again for our people. And so I'm just actually very disappointed in what I've heard. So we need a lot of clarification. Our community needs support and I hope you're willing to provide that. Okay, thank you, uh, Michelle, for your comments uh, as well. Uh, Hazel. Yes, I would just like to make a final comment myself about uh, how difficult it is. I know this person already submitted a claim because the incident that happened at the dental office in Eshwegan, prior to Dr. Crane ever coming, uh, the little girl was crying and the dentist was mad because she was crying, so he slaps her across the face. She goes into the waiting room and her little friend says, you got a hand mark on your face. So how, how come that girl who is the same age as this person today statement wouldn't be sufficient to say, yes, this did happen. Instead, got to look for a dental record wherever on earth it is. It sounds like to me, uh, Hazel, that we would have to look to work directly with an individual specifically on that issue, because uh, it, it sounds like there's more, there's some more to more background on that issue. Not sure if, uh, if Cam, if you have any further that you wanted to add. Um, location is important. I don't know if that's at the dental office or at the school, because um, that dental office is not going to be covered. Um, it has to take place at the school. Um, and if it was a slap or of that nature, Deloitte would probably look at that as disproportionate acts of punishment or discipline, and that would fall into level one, assuming it took place at school. But again, okay. there's, there's probably other facts, I just, yeah. you know, based on what I hear. Okay, thank you for that, Kim. And perhaps, Hazel, what we can do is uh, I could work with you and, and, and out of uh, the chief's office work to work specifically with this individual. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Hazel. All right, to uh, Alyssa and Cam, thank you. As you can see, there is much more support needed within communities, not just in the community of Six Nations. I think there's also in relation to what's happening uh, across this country with uh, residential schools, I, I think that even more needs to be support within communities and a lot more, obviously, uh, you know, as we look towards uh, our healing path. So again, we will we'll reach out to Deloitte and set up uh, more community sessions, but in the meantime, I think more community support as we approach this deadline, we have to get creative because again, the last thing we should see, uh, we would want to see is eligible people who again are eligible for these funds uh, get denied because they're late in submitting an application or they didn't have the support needed to properly fill out an application. So definitely looking forward to how we can uh, converse further on those pieces. Thank you. Uh, that, that being said, can I look to a motion to accept uh, this presentation as information? I'll move, it's Melba. Moved by Melba, second by Sherry Lynn. Are there any further questions or comments? 
Seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motions carried. Again, thank you, Nyala, Cam, and Alyssa for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay, Council, that now leads us into our um, item C under delegations, which is uh, an update uh, from our Community Broadband Task Force. Uh, so I'll pass it over to, I believe it's Darren, Mr. Darren Jameson. I'm just going to attempt to share a screen here. <laughs> okay, one sure, no, here. no problem. We do have members uh, on the task force on joining us this evening as well. People see that? Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Let me see here. Okay, um, just trying to change how my video looks. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna shift this over here. Here we go. Okay, yes, uh, thanks everybody and uh, good, good evening community. Um, yes, we do have members of the Connectivity and Broadband Task Force with us this evening. And I will probably be calling upon them for any sort of technical questions that might arise. And really the purpose for this with this is to update the community. The, the task force has done a lot of work over the last, well, coming up to a year almost um, on, on looking at solutions and bringing in partners to provide um, internet uh, connectivity service, uh, fiber service, uh, high speed internet to the community. And it was really sort of the impetus for it came from, from COVID uh, with a lot of people having to work from home uh, having to attend school uh, at home, uh, doing online learning. And there were a lot of challenges, as everyone knows in the community, and there still are challenges with internet connectivity. So that was really sort of the mandate for the task force. And I'm just gonna kind of flip through the presentation, kind of covers up a nice sort of summary of what, what has occurred. And then we're gonna move into uh, timelines and some of the proposals that we have from three uh, different uh, ISPs uh, looking to provide service to the community. So I basically spoke to this in terms of the COVID and how it, it has affected the communities um, and our ability really um, to learn and our economy uh, was severely impacted. And so, you know, people were confined to their homes, as everyone knows, and unable to, to uh, attend school. So that was a big inequity in the territory. So really, the, the whole purpose was to mandate a task force to address the problem. Uh, so this happened back in October of last year. And uh, that was through through the council, and I was um, asked to chair the task force. And it is by by all means a team a team effort. So that's why my, my the team is here today to to speak to any kind of other issues that come forward. Mine is more from an administrative and linked with council to provide updates, which we've done periodically since that time. Um, but I'll just kind of read the. I think it's important to read out the mandate because it kind of gives you a nice snapshot of of, of the work of the task force. Uh, it was meant to, mandated to design a multi-phase digital community network that serves the needs of and brings benefit to Six Nations of Grand River. The task force will support the design and implementation of this network by procuring and engaging subject matter experts, technical expertise, partnerships, and financing to support construction, ownership, and potentially the operation and maintenance of the network. So the team, um, as, as, I, as I mentioned, as, is, is made up of several folks from the community not just council related. We have the chief uh, who attends fairly regularly on the task force, as well as Tammy. Uh, she she is a used to be a special assistant. Now she's the chief of staff. Uh, myself as the chair, uh, we have the director of public works, who I believe is on the call tonight. Uh, Dave George, our, our uh, information systems manager at council, president for CEO for Development Corporation, uh, Matt Jamison. I think he's on the call as well. Chamber of Commerce, and we brought in Dave Vince from Two Rivers to represent uh, the business community, and he's on the call, I believe. Our communications department, uh, who was originally Candice, and now we have Katie on with us. And of course, Six Nations Polytechnic Senior Advisor would be Linda Parker, and she's also on our call tonight. And we always always had us with our task force, as always, we leave a seat open for uh, the Confederacy Council to attend. So at present, there is no one has been attending, but offered. It's, it's always there and the seat is always open. So again, our role again was to, is to pursue those partnerships, technical expertise and funding, advocate for any policy changes that are needed to support merit-based funding proposals and facilitate engagement with stakeholders. 
So beyond the core team, we had a broader, a broader group, uh, which is not just from the community, but around the area. Because uh, the community may not be, be aware, uh, there was a, a couple of different programs that were um, let in, in the fall and into the, the new year. One was the SWIFT, which is uh, rural broadband uh, supports uh, in the area. And the other one was the Universal Broadband Fund. So we wanted to kind of co correlate and, co and, and work with the, the communities around us if there's a partnership to be had in terms of bringing those services on a volume basis, uh, where, where the economics of the proposal or project makes more sense. So we, we invited and we widened the net in terms of who we would have on our broader um, group to inform the work that we did. So there, you can see the list, I'm not gonna go through it in, in detail, but we had uh, a few meetings with the larger group early, especially particularly in the early days to help guide and also to liaise on what plans other groups outside the community as well, MPPs and neighboring counties and communities, what their plans were and how it could potentially work together. So again, I just I already captured that, so I'm not gonna go through that too much in terms of uh, what their what their role was in assisting us get to where we are today. This is a this is a really helpful slide. Um, this really kind of goes through a timeline for us in terms of what the steps or activities were undertaken since uh, last fall. So back in November of 2020, um, we had uh, several providers approach Six Nations of the Grand River to look at ways to provide internet service connectivity. One of those, of course, is exploring it. You can see the picture of the towers. So that was sort of the impetus on how this kind of got started. Uh, then we looked at reviewing funding opportunities. I spoke a little bit in terms of the SWIFT and the, the prospect of the Universal Broadband Fund. So Six Nations Remember uh, provided a letter of support to ExploreNet for the SWIFT grant, which they were successful in obtaining. And that was to provide say, some services in rural branches north of the Grand River and into the uh, core of Six Nations. In December of 2020, uh, the team sought to be more inclusive and more comprehensive in terms of service to the entire territory. So we undertook an expression of interest approach and we invited 17 companies to respond to the expression of interest, who would be our, uh, our technical partner in, in building out a design and, and build for infrastructure to the community. We received three responses uh, to the expression of interest. And, on, and in January, based on a review, a due diligence process that was followed uh, with a subset of our team, uh, Rogers was named as the UBF technical partner, and that was in January of this year. Um, and again, I already alluded to the fact that Explornet was successful in getting the SWIFT grant funds to do their portion. So in February of 2021, uh, we undertook to draft an MOU with Rogers based on our selection of them as our technical partner. And part of that process was to get letters of support to support a, their application to U Universal Broadband Fund. And that was 30 letters that were, were received from community groups, uh, organizations, uh, so very, council provided one letter, the rest came from other groups in the community. So in March of 2021, Rogers uh, decided because of timing and because of wanting to get going sooner, um, they made a commitment to forego the UBF and provide their own capital for the investment and build out of, of the fiber network within Six Nations. So that was in, back in March. And so based on that, uh, we undertook to have weekly meetings with Rogers to understand how that would roll out. And given that ExploreNet and there would be some overlap and some, I'll call it redundancy of, of service connectivity options for, for community, which is not a bad thing. Uh, we facilitated meetings between Rogers and ExploreNet for those areas that were covered within the SWIFT uh, design areas. Uh, and in May of 2021, uh, Rogers ExploreNet planned their connectivity builds, uh, community engagement plans begin. And in June of 2021, uh, Rogers and ExploreNet began work to work in the community just very lightly to look kind of the survey work and understand where the design would go. And all through this process, I'm just going to pause here for one second. Back in um, December, uh, we did invite First Nations Cable to submit an expression of interest. And for reasons, um, some personal and, and some others, uh, they did not submit at that time. So they did come back, come to us in July of 2020 to share their plans, what their plans were for providing service to the community. So now we have Rogers, we have Explorant, and we have First Nations Cable as part of this presentation. Uh, so we thought it was important to bring it to community as soon as possible, just so they could see 
what the options might be going forward, and also to look at uh, support in terms of the timeliness of how we want to roll out these options. So I'll just keep going. If that's okay, Chief, I'll just keep going. And uh, we'll, maybe we'll pause uh, a little bit later on in the presentation. So as I mentioned, we had three vendors um, offering connectivity solutions, First Nations Cable, Rogers, and ExploreNet. So I'm going to go through a snapshot of, of some of the highlights of what their proposed connectivity solutions look like. And uh, team, if you have any additions to, to what I say, feel free to jump in. I can't see you all because I'm looking at the screen or reading from the screen. So just uh, jump in if, if, you, uh, if you feel that's uh, needed. Did I lose my screen? Do you guys still, still associate a screen? Feel good. All right, I did something goofy with my computer. Okay, let's go through these. The proposed solution for First Nations Cable is in-ground fiber optics, very similar uh, for all three, in-ground and aerial fiber optics for Rogers. ExploreNet was in-ground and aer aerial fiber optics. All the technologies, and this is an important one because there's concerns in the community about 5G. All three are offering a 4G solution. So similar in terms of that. Estimated timeline, now this is where we get into some differences. And part of this is to do with cap capital or ability to, to accelerate the project or the build out. Uh, First Nations Cable has, has indicated to us they've got it, they have a plan. They've got it phased out with different pieces of the territory mapped out. And their, their commitment would be around a three year period. It could be a little bit longer, but that's what they're saying right now. Um, and with Rogers, they're saying one to one and a half years. If you recall, Rogers did make a presentation on a live stream with council back in uh, late winter where they kind of laid that out. Uh, and with ExploreNet, it would be 4G live fiber and also five, one and a half years. Part of the reason why it's one and a half years is there was sort of a, the hope that they could do it this year and get it done by the fall. Uh, but because of the consider, we wanted to have some consideration for First Nations Cable, having shared their plans late with us, uh, that's been, uh, I guess, a bit of a delay. So that's the reason why they, so, I know there were some questions about that in the past. So. Can we ask questions while we're going or what's the case? Sure, you can. Go ahead, Helen. No, I want to go back to that other one. You which, which one? Which one? Uh, yeah. The only difference that I can see, the big difference that I can see is that First Nations Cable is, it's all optic, fiber optic, which to me, that I understand is the best thing for our reserve. The Rogers and the ExploreNet are going to be doing towers, right? Isn't that aerial? Is aerial fiber optic towers? I'll, I'll let my technical folks answer. Go ahead, Lynn. <laughs> I was gonna say, if I can respond, um, the aerial fiber that they're proposing is it's called through something called shared access or open access. So they may be using the existing hydro lines or existing towers, but they're going to use existing infrastructure so that it can be a quicker build out okay. and a less expensive build out. But they're all doing fiber to the home. Yeah, because anybody that I've ever talked to said fiber is the way to go. I know it costs more money and it's going to take longer, but it's the better thing for our community. So just yeah. to clarify, they're all doing fiber to the home. Absolutely. Whether it's in ground or whether it's aerial, it's all fiber. Okay. We'll keep going. So the, again, I've already alluded to this a little bit in terms of the proposed service area. Uh, all are looking to do the entire community. Um, Exploring it is, is only looking to do, as I said, sort of those core zones as part of their SWIFT uh, project, which is you know obviously in tandem with their towers, the new towers, the project that is, is supposed to be activated this week. So that's part of that, their solution is portions of Chiefswood Road, which is a higher density area, uh, third line, fourth line, and sixth line. So that was part of the SWIFT project uh, approval. So they would be um, looking at providing that as an option uh, within the territory, as well as any of the three uh, could potentially be a choice for, for community members. Uh, in terms of the no number of stages, um, First Nations Cable, as I alluded to, would take about a three years. So there's three st a three stage approach uh, in terms of where the what areas of the reserve would receive um, services. Um, and Rogers and ExploreNet would be looking at one build, as I mentioned, over that one and a half year period. So sometime next year, around this time or into the fall, the entire community would be connected and have that as an option for service. In terms of the project funding and costs to the community. In all cases, 
all ISPs have made a commitment that there will be zero investment or cost to the community in terms of the capital infrastructure build. I'm gonna get into the service plans, the next connect connection fees and all that stuff. So there will be obviously a cost to homes in terms of uh, getting the service to the home. But in terms of the actual build, there's no cost in any of the cases. A little bit about the providers, going through this in some detail, because again, this came a little bit late um, and also for, for members of council is may not have had an opportunity to review it. Uh, so First Nations Cable, as you know, has been involved originally with cable TV and then they expanded to internet services uh, starting in 92. They have nine employees all from the community, uh, 800 and currently 800 subscribers, primarily again in the, in the Chiefswood core area. Uh, Rogers has been around for quite some time, since 1960. They have a lot of employees, a lot of subscribers. Exploring is a little bit smaller. I've uh, been around since 2004, so you can see the numbers there. Here's where it gets a little bit more interesting in terms of the, there are some differences, but services and plan types. And again, team, uh, if I say something wrong or you want to add additional clarity, please do. Uh, in terms of the plan services uh, and, and types, uh, for First Nations Cable, we're looking at internet cable, and Rogers is internet uh, TV, uh, mobile, and smart home monitoring, and Explornet is internet and TV, and Audrey has a question. Go ahead, Audrey. Can you please uh, clarify how they do their smart home monitoring? Uh, team? <laughs> <laughs> I thought so, dear. <laughs> I have but, an idea, but I don't want to answer wrong. Yeah, I was going to say, yes, Linda, you know, I mean, you know, think of, you know, it's just a digital device. So that device is, is just another device on their network. So they know when your, you know, when your service is down, but no, we, we can't speak to how it's done specifically. It's just part of the network, you know, another device on the network. So, so sorry, what kind of things does it cover in your house? Then? I'm sorry? What does it cover in your house? What does it do for you? Well, whatever, whatever smart home monitors, you know, you'd have to have the system in place. Like an ADT okay, system, I'll, right? You know, I'll like Rogers. they sell yeah. mobile cameras, you know, for homes. So yes. that's what they call smart home monitoring. So you'd actually have to have the system in, in order for them to monitor it, I presume. But anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, I think so. I think it's just being have, having the, the you know, the, the, the capacity to handle that is probably one of the issues too. Is it like a security system too? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so again, the, uh, this, this is consistent to residential and commercial, so institutional as, as well, obviously, as part of that those groups. Uh, so hours of service, currently First Nations Cable is nine to five, sort of standard business hours. They do have on-call after hours calls, but they would like to move to a 24-7 uh, to match Rogers and Explorant into the future. Uh, as obviously you're going to have a lot more uh, demand out there. Now we're going to go kind of split into the, each of the separate ISPs to provide the price options. Uh, and, and this is more tied to the fiber op offerings. Uh, so we'll start with ExploreNet. So there's a monthly service fee, uh, $99. And you'll see it's related to the download and upload speeds. So the, the greater that is, the price goes up. And on, on, in all cases, the data is unlimited. There is an, a one-time installation fee of $99. It's a one-year term, and the router hub 5.0 is included. Now, Linda, would you have anything to say about those speeds? <laughs> so people, people are questioning what that is. I think it's just more speed, right? As in just the 99 or the... Or all of them. Like if you look at the relationship between the pricing and the speeds. Oh yes, absolutely. It, it's just a, a faster service, so you have more devices on, and you'd still get you know the same amount of service out of it. But yes, right. so with every escalation or incremental uh, cost, you have more. Think of it as lanes on a highway, so you can get more cars on, more traffic in your home. So you can have someone in your home gaming. You can have someone on a Zoom call. You can have someone else watching something on Netflix, right? Yes, that's <laughs> okay. pretty much what it is. <laughs> okay. D Darren, uh, just really quickly, if I can uh, interrupt really fast, and no can I just ask you to uh, increase your screen a little bit more? Just uh, see, it's at sixty-seven percent. If you just want to hit your plus button on the on the bottom there. Oh yeah, yeah. Where is it, Darren? I got it. 
that's too big now. Too big? Yeah, maybe 80%. <laughs> or 75. There's 75. Yeah, that, that works. Thank you. Sorry, yeah, I think Kerry uh, had a question. Or is that Kerry or Matt? Yeah, Kerry. Oh. Uh, Darren, uh, the, for the existing customers that I have ExploreNet now, and they're aimed at the, there's dishes are aimed at the old towers. Do they have to now get them aimed to the new towers or, or, or what's the, what's the situation there that, uh, and, and since they're existing customers, would it be free or do they still have to pay for exploring that to come in and aim them to the new towers now? Mm -hmm. I'm going to call upon Matt to answer that question. I believe Matt had a follow-up question as well anyway. So over to you, Matt. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. Thanks. Um, so as it relates to the turning on of the, of the new towers, Kerry, uh, I've been in contact fairly frequently with ExploreNet. In fact, they're going to be uh, at Chiefwood Park as part of the Community Awareness Week. I think it's tomorrow. Um, so they're going to be there to answer questions for uh, community members around the service. There's going to be a process of migration from customers from the old towers to the new towers. We expect those towers to be operational as, uh, as early as this week, uh, and, but the migration period will take some time. I've asked ExploreNet to send out an email campaign to all of their existing customers explaining the process around how they would go to migrate over to the new platform. And they have committed to doing that. I just haven't seen any, any of the actual collateral yet. So I would expect within the next, um, next few days and certainly through the booth at the Community Awareness Week with um, ExploreNet for them to be able to answer those questions specifically. Um, the one thing I did want to say around the rates, I know that um, some of the other companies we have is, are, are quoted as a 50, 10, that would be 50 download, 10 upload speeds on their fiber platform. ExploreNet didn't quote that price here on this schedule because it's not really something that they offer because they offer 50, 10 through their wireless network that they're building in the towers today. I did ask them to give us the price for what would be um, a, a 50, 25, which would be the smallest package that they would offer, which would be $89. So it's not an apples to apples comparison per se, but the smallest fiber package that Explorer would offer would be $89 for a 50, 25 download upload speed. Hopefully that answers the question. Okay, thank you. Think, yeah, uh, and I have one other uh, one other question is, um, are those towers which are shorter now going to be able to like where I live on fifth line? Like I'm in the I'm in the bush and and, and the signal is, you'd be lucky to get it anytime. Like so, with the new towers coming on, with the updated equipment, would I would I be able to re have better um, signal or would it have to be would it have to someone have to come out to say okay well you're out of luck <laughs> so I, I mean i can comment to that um and so the, the new technologies the 3.5 gigahertz technology is it's a licensed spectrum and it's designed specifically to penetrate trees way better than the existing 2.3 platform they have now uh, it was specifically designed uh, for our community given the density of tree coverage and uh, some of the topography here, although it's not guaranteed we're going to reach 100% of the houses. So there are certain homes that may be in a valley with tremendous tree coverage, which will be difficult to reach. So I, I can say, Carrie, it's probably going to best to be on a case-by-case -case basis. Once they send out that campaign to, to their existing customers, I would suggest that you contact them, give them your new number, and they'll be able to pull it up on the computer and tell you fairly quickly. And just, just for the benefit of everyone who's listening, uh, the the ExploreNet um, in the park, the Chiefswood Park, will be happening on August the 16th, Monday, from 10 a.m. until 5 p.m. And that will be in Chiefswood Park. They'll have a, a tent set up for people to come in and ask any questions that they want, talk about the, the new fiber project and, and what their participation might be, and most importantly, what's happening with the wireless tower installations and how to migrate over. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Matt and, and Carrie. I believe uh, Wendy has a question as well. Thanks, Mark. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Darren. A few questions, certainly one on cost, um, what the rates are being indicated here. 
I'm just trying to think back to the original proposal when this all started to form, because I think we asked some very specific questioning about increased rates, what the rate um, scale would be, and we were sure that there would be no increases, anything. And I don't recall the rates being this high when we had that discussion <clears throat> and when we agreed to this and going down this avenue. So if you can provide clarification on that, I think that would be helpful. Um, the other one is, you know, talking about existing homes that have difficulty with access right now while all this work is going on and what the improvements will be, but new home builders in the community have absolutely no access right now because they're being told by all providers, there's no room down here. And providers are saying they have no idea when there will be room. So what's happening with that in relation to all the work that's being done? And the third piece is, at the beginning of the presentation, there was a slide on membership. And I don't quite understand that because the task force has specific work to do. So why is there a membership? It makes it sound like it's a, an organization being built in an entity with those members. So just not sure where this is going. So you can provide clarity on that. Well, you had a few questions there. Um... And that the rates before and, and, and how, the, how they've been um, increased or same, uh, I think we'll have to do a follow-up on that piece. Um, and I think uh, as well, that we're gonna go through the Rogers and First Nations cable rates as well for comparison. That's part of the presentation to just understand that. But I, I take your point and we'll do some follow-up. I don't know whether we can give a quick answer now. I, I would look to Matt perhaps. I think it'd be comparable to the lower price level, I'm not sure, Matt, in terms of, I can't recall the specifics, in terms of what the services are offered right now. Uh, so maybe I'll pause. The, is there any, a quick answer to that one, Matt? I'd have to go back and look at the actual discussion that happened, but I will say this, that you know, I'm a current subscriber to ExploreNet Wireless, and I pay a lot more than what the, the minimum package is here for fiber. So I think it's a function of right. uh, the, the quality, the speed you're going to get, um, and, and what the cost will be based on the platform that you want, right? Uh, right now, my, my internet service is $100 a month and that's sort of a basic uh, coverage. So but I don't know about any promises that, that were made, but we can go back and look at what that discussion was. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'd appreciate that because we actually had notes. There was a presentation and it was within the presentation and we uh -huh. got guaranteed that they would not increase and that would not be higher than what was being presented. So just a cross check, perhaps it's my memory that's, you know, maybe I'm, misinformed and I don't remember, but if we can get that um, information. Sure. sure, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Um, so, so in terms of, um, you know, providers saying, saying that, I think once, once the fiber is installed, I, there, there will be a lot of uh, service. I'm not sure if that's your question specifically, but um, that's kind of the current state is, is, is limited. That, that's absolutely true. Uh, because of the tree cover and because we have wireless uh, at the at the moment so but once we have the fiber uh, for the community it we will have a lot of uh, width to be able to take take on uh, whatever is required within the community so uh, new clients because what people are they can't get any service whatsoever so these okay. companies will not accept them at all right now that's what's happening okay we'll follow that one up for sure that's sh that should uh, not be the case um, and in terms of the membership, uh, it's not really that. I mean, we we just kind of said, well, we want to have sectors represented and it's a task force. We have a job to do. We're mandated to do a specific thing. And then, you know, there, the idea was that this would change over time or even be disbanded over time. Uh, and then maybe we would look at, depending on um, how we want to, it's like any other, any other industry. Uh, if it's open access, it's open access. Or do we want to get into some sort of a regulatory uh, component to it in terms of rates, et cetera. So that's down the road, but I think it was really just to kind of inform what others are doing in the area. Uh, and there was really sort of a, just sort of a, a list that was created um, and we thought it was a good list. And we had a lot of really good participation uh, from, from the broader group. And I, I would hesitate to use the word membership and that's probably not the right word. Um, and we would probably would have accepted anyone to come to the table if they had concerns our views, our options for us to consider. So that so was just something, something to put on paper, I guess. Yeah. Participants more than. Ever. Yeah, yeah. Thank you.
problem. Thank you. Um, is there more questions? And we can move to the next rates. There's a few uh, community questions coming in, uh, Darren, but maybe perhaps we could get through the rates and I can go back to look at the community questions coming in. Yeah, thanks, Chief. I think that that would be helpful just so everybody can have some comparison and some points of reference uh, and better understand, uh, I guess, what the service plans or offerings are. So this is the, the map showing the, 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 I guess, the backbone uh, fiber light lay for the ExploreNet um, project. Uh, and I think, uh, Council, you've seen this before, or basically, and it was in an open session, I believe, it just basically goes through Chiefs Road fourth line and kind of sixth line and a bit of third line, as, as I described before. And that's tied again to that Swift project, which goes into Grant County down along the north side of the river uh, towards this side of Brantford. Uh, so that's, it's not, uh, but by no means covers the entire community. So that's their map. And you won't see maps for anybody else because Rogers is covering the whole territory and, and also with First Nations Cable, although they'll be staged over three years is their proposal. So we'll focus on Rogers right now. Uh, we did request for all ISPs to provide us a rate. And so Matt, thank you for adding, giving us that number from ExploreNet as it wasn't captured in our chart for a 5010 um, uh, speeds um, with unlimited data, internet only. So with Rogers, it's 84.99 a month uh, for up to five devices. Uh, so in terms of what includes the upload speed is up to the 10. Obviously that's what the 10 represents, megabytes per second. Uh, Ignite Wi-Fi gateway modem rental, um, hub for easy network control and protection. It's 24 seven support, of course, and that the five and five email accounts would go along with that as well. And then we move to First Nations Cable. And everyone knows who First Nations Cable is. Um, they've been around for a while in the community. So their proposed rate for 5010 would be $65. And they also wanted to provide a 7510 rate of 80 and, and with unlimited data at 125. Now, I don't have clarity on this, um, but it's it sounds to me by reading this that there would be some limitations on the lower speeds, but I'm not certain. I'll have to do a follow-up with First Nations Cable on that. Uh, the business customer bill package would be suited to their needs. So those are the differences in the rates. Um, sort of this is our final slide on this presentation. And the way it's kind of changed over time, this industry, this sector really is it's more it's all about open access. And really what that means is more options for customers. It's good for the consumer, you know, keeps rates down. Uh, so that's kind of what this slide is kind of speaking to. And part of that is well, the backbone or the infrastructure. Uh, Rogers and Explorer have agreed to work together in terms of their infrastructure and do one big policy. And First Nations Cable is not, they're are very hesitant to do that. They, they pretty much said a no to that. What they've said is they're okay with wireless with the com competitors, but not fiber. So that's kind of been their stance uh, pretty much since we've reconnected with them in the last month or so. So that's kind of the differences between all of the ISPs and uh, just to give you the uh, the snapshot for, for all of that stuff. And I guess before we go to uh, questions, Chief, uh, with the community and others, what we had wanted to do as a group, because we have these options uh, and we have some, some differences of opinion in terms of how we want to proceed, is to follow this presentation up. This is obviously an information update and sharing with community would be follow this up with a survey to community to say, you know, do you want to look at all three? Do you want to accelerate the build and work with Rogers and explore it now and perhaps still have space for First Nations cable into the future? Do you want to have, you know, all three at the same time? Or do you want to pause and and wait until First Nation, we hear a little bit more in terms of First Nations cable in their application to the UBF fund. And apparently we it's been confirmed that they did, they did apply. I don't have any kind of information as to whether they've actually been approved or not. So there will be a bit of a pause, a very brief pause, I understand it, uh, to be able to get that information. So we would look at three or four, maybe five questions, very simple to the point. And uh, that would be a follow-up exercise uh, after tonight so that the task force would undertake to develop those questions and they would be available uh, to provide communities input on the direction to go. Uh, this starting this year potentially and into next year to have these services available. Um, so we would basically say ExploreNet tick, Rogers tick, First Nations Cable tick, all three tick, 
And that's basically uh, how we would probably structure that survey. Very simple. So maybe I'll just pause there um, and we can kind of go into some questions uh, related to this. And obviously we're, we're also against the weather clock a little bit if we want to get things started this year. Um, we heard from Matt in terms of exploring it on the towers being activated. So that will provide some additional coverage within the community. It won't be high speed fiber, but it'll, it'll provide better coverage than what we have currently. And to get us through this, the balance of this year, if we wait and potentially start in the fall, we, we would certainly not be done. In, in, if say in the case of Rogers doing the entire community would not be done until probably this time next year. So I'll just pause there and uh, well, maybe I'll leave this one up because this is kind of a, a good summary of what, what the task force has been has been doing over the last few months. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Darren. Uh, you may have to uh, go decrease your percentage now on that screen. Okay. Um, but I will look to uh, questions. I know there are a number, uh, a few I see within the chat. I see Wendy also has her hand up and any other counselors uh, I don't see. So Wendy, you have the floor. Thanks. I, I... I'm not comfortable with, you know, just I know there's more discussion and there's more work to be done, but I'm not comfortable with the options of, you know, do we go with this company, this company, and, you know, do we exclude, you know, one of our own companies here in the community? Whatever the issues are, I think we should be doing work to try and support our own existing company here in the community to be able to provide service as well, because it's always, you know, that economic base that we try and support our own and and do that so I don't know what's being done and what plan within the task force is existing to do that um, you know I know Darren you presented that there are issues however it, it's like the big box stores right we've seen it through COVID we've seen it happen all over the place where small businesses can't compete with the larger box stores everybody goes to Costco to get supplies instead of going to the local store um, to support that. So th that's the scenario that I see. And sorry if I'm oversimplifying that, but I think we should be supporting our own. And how do we make sure that there's business here in the community going forward? Um, I, and that's just my comment. The other piece is what about community members that have other service providers right now? What happens to them and how do they get access or it, does it mean that going through this process that community members have to drop their existing service provider and go to somebody else if they want good connectivity okay so yeah, oh, sorry ahead, chief i was just going to respond quickly um in terms of the uh, working with our local we have we have made many attempts to work with First Nations Cable. In fact, we, we presented options of working with specifically Rogers, um, where they would be the face of the, they would be basically be the provider. Um, but uh, their, their stance has kind of been, yes, we'll, we'll look at that. And then they kind of pull back and said, well, no, we want to have, we want to have, for lack of a better term, uh, monopoly over fiber within the territory. Uh, so that was the, that was kind of the, the position they, that, that First Nations Cable took. We try to open up the conversation around partnering, um, you know, even an exit strategy for Rogers and or Explornet over time. Um, but that was kind of met with some re receptivity and then there was a bit of a pullback. So that's kind of what I can say. Well, there has been a lot of effort there, um, particularly in the last two months, uh, because really hasn't, they didn't share their plans with, with us until then. Um, with the, there was an opportunity to do it earlier. And as I said, there were some personal issues with the company uh, that they didn't didn't submit, so I also think that perhaps that they were weren't ready uh, to to really take this on. So that's part of it. Um, yeah, and your question about other other services, yeah, I mean it depends on whether they're they're tied with with these these companies as resellers or what have you. Um, we didn't go dig that deep. I think at some point as a task force, we kind of step away and say, okay, this is a a solution that's offered by three ISPs into the community, um, potentially, if that's the way, the way we wanna go. And I understand your concerns about this option or that option, but I think uh, my own personal view, and it's, it's I'm a chair, I don't really not supposed to have an opinion, but I think choice is good. I mean, that's what it's about. Open access keeps everything, everybody honest. And uh, that would be 
a consideration. So I'm going to pause there because I, I would rather maybe have other task force members comment, maybe perhaps more specifically to the first question, uh, and we can go on from there. I just just really quickly, uh, if if I could add as well, uh, you know, we've we've been in dialogue and, and have had multiple meetings uh, with. Uh, the owner of First Nations Cable and uh, Wendy, I'm much the, along the same thinking of you, and 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 has been communicated to uh, to Jeff on that piece in terms of how we work together. I mean, it comes to a point in time where we see this over and over on multiple uh, you know opportunities where you know it's just it comes down to opposition to so much opposition to where we're now missed opportunity. Uh, and so I think that's part of where, you know, we've been, and, and I think that's why the re-engagement uh, with the task force and First Nations Cable has, as you see in, on the timeline in July, to again, get back to how we can actually get this work, you know, working together and so forth. So, uh, you know, I think nonetheless, it's still uh, important that we, you know, support local uh, businesses and, while while still completing a big project like this, and should be able to do that collectively. And uh, again, to meet uh, a dire need within our community. So, uh, you know, we've had really good conversations. Uh, we want to continue those conversations again to see where we can, uh, you know, continue that growth in terms of relationship in in business in general. Just. Oh, uh, when, Sorry, go ahead, I can just do a follow up and, and I appreciate that and I've heard the updates and I, I know that there's work going on so, but I just, you know, in, in large business and maybe I'm watching too many movies but you know it almost sounds like a hostile takeover and maybe that's a scenario that's out there I mean I, you know, small businesses look at things and interpret things different way with large very large companies coming in like a Rogers and and so on so, you know. It goes back to the options, like you say, Darren. I think options are great too. It, community members should have a choice. And how do we feed in? How do we support a plan of a First Nations cable while still going this route with a Rogers Explorinet and community exactly. members have options? But we should be providing some sort of some supportive means to, if that's a plan they want to do, then let's allow them to do that because they've done all the, the grunt work to, to have and build what we have now. So, I mean, we should appreciate that too. And I'm not saying that we don't, but just in terms of supporting the plan going forward, I think it's important to do. Definitely. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your comments. I just want to check in. Sherry Lynn, did you? Yeah, okay. I see your hand raised. Sherry Lynn? Um, yeah, I just have a question in regards to this update. Yes, it's on uh, Facebook, like right now live, but how are we getting this update out to the community? because we need to keep the community informed and bring them along in this process. So how is that gonna be rolled out after this? Question. Yeah, sure. Um, this would be available. Um, I think there's a couple of tweaks that need to be, you know, uh, be, from the questions that were raised tonight to make for clarity, um, I think would be important to improve upon this, but that this would be posted on the website as well as those questions that I was talking about in terms of the survey. Um, and it's really not, a, a, and I, I take, the, point um, Councillor Johnson's raising about an either or I, I don't think that that's the, the intent the intent is to kind of lay out here's what we've been able and it's a good news story really we have some solutions before us here's how they could be rolled out um, and I think that that's we don't want to as to the chief's point we don't want to lose the opportunity of and the momentum and we want to keep it rolling so really what it is and, and all ISP were agreeable to going to the community excuse my dog's barking they were all agreeable to to going to the community with this uh, to gauge, you know, um, what the community wanted to do in terms of these these options that are before us. So absolutely, Sherry Lynn, uh, this would all be part of that rollout. And we need to do it fairly quickly because we're running out of time. Chris and I Parker. guess, yeah, and I guess the other part, yes, it can go on the website, but I guess it's for the people who don't have internet and stuff. How are they gonna get this information? Yep, and I, I, I talked to Katie, um, are we connected? Uh, Katie's has has uh, good communication strategies on getting it to everyone as 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 inclusive as possible within the community. So she's ready to go with all of that. Okay, so I see uh, Audrey. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, supporting local um, vendors, but I also think we have to um, keep in mind the reason why we're doing this. 
and there was a big outcry from the, the community saying, we want our student, uh, children who are learners to be able to connect. Like our, our community members were paying outrageous amounts of money to make sure that their kids could get on the internet and complete their homework. We have people who are working at home. Uh, so I think we have to really balance that. It's a, it's a balance out there. And I think you're doing a really good job and I do appreciate all the hard work that's gone into this by everyone. Yawa. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Audrey, for your comments. Are there any further questions or comments or any further additional comments from any of the task force? I have one, Chief, if I could. So I sure. just wanted to highlight the impact. Um, I, I, I went ahead and, uh, you know, with the support of some of the, the members here and did a lot of the engagement for the tower project. And I heard a lot of different stories, some, some I didn't think of. Um, and I, I just want to leave that, let's let that resonate in that I had a lot of different providers of services like counseling say that they couldn't counsel youth because they didn't have connectivity, they didn't have proper connectivity. They couldn't, they couldn't engage with them like they needed to. Um, I've heard stories about people sleeping in the Tim Hortons parking lot to get Wi-Fi. Um, those different things are happening right here in our community. And I think we're all aware of that, but um, I, I just don't think, you know, uh, we can get this done in a year and a half and it can make a big difference. Um, but I, 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 I can't, it, it's gonna have a big impact if we, you know, prolong this uh, a year and a half longer than it needs to be. So I, I agree with the timeliness and the, the sense of urgency because it looks like we're headed towards another school year similar to what we had. Maybe there'll, there'll be some kind of hybrid model. I know that presentation is forthcoming, but there's gonna be a component of online learning for everybody. And it's imperative that we, you know, we were, we were set to, to task and uh, we came back with three good options and options for the community to decide. And looking at uh, even even the providers in the community, like you know, we have a Tim Hortons um, in the community right now. That's that's, um, and I haven't seen any kind of negative impacts to other providers. So again, the community has their choice, right? Okay, thank you, uh, thank thank you, Mike, for your comments. I believe is that Hazel. Yes, it's me. Um, I just want to make a comment about the stage that we're at with getting high speed internet service for the community. I, for one, will be most appreciative when that happens because, as you all know, throughout our Zoom meetings, it's been, it's been a real tough job trying to keep up when you keep being disconnected. And I, too, agree with our local people having the jobs, but in this case, um, and when I've been through, I'm going to go with the first one that, you know, has the high speed and it reaches my house because, um, like I said, I had brought Explore Net in before to see what the problem was. And I don't, my, where I live, it doesn't even reach any of the towers that are currently existing. They said mine goes to a satellite. And I don't know where that satellite is. It must be on Mars because it takes forever sometimes to go up there and come back. So um, I think this task force has done a good job with what they presented. And, um, you know, you got the experts on there. I know Linda Parker, she's been a IT person for years. So I would go with their good expertise and just... Um, Hopefully everything will work out good for everyone on the reserve. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Hazel, for your comments as well. Uh, just wanna maybe check in with Darren if there's any, maybe perhaps any closing comments uh, or anything further on your end. No, no, thanks, Chief. I think uh, it was a very good discussion. You raised some good issues. I mean, we're, we're, we're aware of all the issues, obviously. Uh, we've been living and breathing this for a while. It's been a priority amongst all of our priorities like Mike, Mike spoke very well. I appreciate his comments. Um, you know, the impacts are important and I agree. I'm also a big supporter of local business and we, and we are, we have tried to work with them and we continue to try regardless of what, you know, what, which way we go. I think, uh, I think part of it is just to bring, bring the community up to speed to see that this is actually a good news story. We've got some really viable options before us and you know, we won't be in the same situation we were last winter. Well, perhaps not this one, this winter will be a little bit some will have and some will have better. I think it's probably the better, the best way to describe it. But next, certainly next year, we will not have this issue again. 
that's that's Great. that's my 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 opinion yeah. and view on it. And I don't really have anything more to say other than we have we all undertake to follow up as we've noted, and uh, let the community uh, provide some input as well. Okay, thank you, Darren. Actually, I, I want to just uh, switch back really quickly to some questions uh, sure. within the chat. Uh, the first question coming from Facebook is, uh, where is the environmental impact information? What possible health concerns should I know about for myself and for plants, animals, water in the, in, in the surrounding community? So that's an environment question. Yeah. Um, who wants to take that on the team? Looking to the team. Oh, is if, if if that one's for the uh, the tower project, um, the the explorer has to go through the abide by the safety code six document. So they got to adhere to mission standards as set up by the government, and uh, the frequencies they use today are already deployed and have been used for many years. So uh, also, you know, as far as it, it, it anything constructed it within the right of way um, is usually exempt from a lot of the environmental impact. Uh, regulations because it's a travel right away um, saying that would that would apply to the, the fiber being installed along the, the roadway or the right away. Yeah, I guess the only other comment to that would be that they I know with Explornet and Rogers would agree to a one dig policy. So there would be minimal impact as far as the construction goes. Okay, uh, thank you. I'm not sure if uh, I, Linda had went off of mute. Just wanted to check in with Linda if you had any further additional comments yeah I, I i do have a, a couple of pieces to clarify thanks very much um just going back to the wendy to your um comment you know about the surveys and and local we've we've struggled and we've worked very hard but you know our mandate is to bring the service and the choices to community and we've done that and i guess at the end of the day you know community still has a choice whether you start with the first provider that goes by your house and then you want to switch later because it's not your preferred provider you know you still have that choice and it's also my understanding that there may be a you know a, a timeline for a build but you don't have to wait until the end of it my understanding is every single one of these providers when their fiber goes by your home it's you're not going to wait you know the, the full length of their project to be connected so i just want to remind community and and you know that there's lots of choices here. It's like a marriage, you know, when you're done with one, you, you go on to the next. <laughs> but uh, it's, you know, there's many options. And really that was, as Darren has said, you know, multiple times, there's, we have a good package for a community to consider. And, you know, if, if your choice, your vendor of record or choice is not there just yet, well, you'll, you'll have an interim solution. So. I just wanted to, to kind of clarify on that specifically with the timelines, because you know what, coming back to school in the fall and if, if we're going to be stuck at home again and kids are going to be learning, as, as Councillor Hazel says, right, people just want the first service that that's accessible to them. And uh, you're going to have lots of options, but you don't have to stay with it, you know, at the first provider forever. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Linda, for your comments uh, as well. Uh, there is another question coming in from Facebook uh, that reads, say I want a certain internet speed. Am I going to get it or does it depend on my location? And I think Darren, you may have touched on this piece as well, but uh, looking to that question. <laughs> I'll wait for my team to chime in here. I'll, so this I'll, is, this is a, speed, a speed question. Really, yeah. I mean, yes, I would say the answer is yes, because if it's a fiber to the home, you know, that that's the speed you're going to get. That's not contingent on, you know, weather and trees and et cetera. That's fiber to your home. So they can guarantee that you, that the rates that they're subscribing, that's what you're going to get. That's the difference between a wireless technology and a, and a fiber, uh, fiber solution. Yeah, see, Linda, you're going to say what I was going to say anyway, so you got it. <laughs> if it's fiber, if it's fiber, it's more reliable and it's more certain, right? That's the key. So that's why that's why it's important to move from just wireless option to fiber, and if, eventually that'll go away. 
Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Linda and Darren as well. Another, there's two more just coming in. Uh, one is, was First Nations Cable given a chance to provide service to the res? So we've, we've answered that question. And as you've seen in the presentation, uh, very much so, uh, given the chance and have the opportunity. The other piece, our question rather coming in is, when are the new towers going to be put into use? I think also Matt had already touched on that question earlier. Uh, if Matt's still on the line and maybe can provide just to reiterate when the new towers will be in operation. Yeah, thanks, Chief. Yep. So we are, we did encounter a little bit of a delay energizing a couple of towers, but it's our plan to have all of those towers fully functional by no later than the end of August. So once that happens, as I mentioned earlier, I've asked ExploreNet to issue a an email campaign to all of their existing subscribers to outline what the process is to migrate over to the new service. And so they'll, they will take on that process. And I, you know, I've been advised that it can take quite some time um, because I'm sure there'll be a lot of demand, but I think it's most important that as soon as that communication comes out to put your name down and get, your, get yourself on the list so that you can make that migration. But they will be functional by the end of this month. Okay, perfect, great, thanks for, thanks for that, Matt. So those are the, all the questions I see uh, coming in so far. But again, just want to say thank you, Nyawa, to, to Darren, and as well as all the uh, rest of the team on the task force. Again, just to kind of go over some of the highlights, there will be further follow-up. Oh, sorry, Kerry, did you have a question? Ah, uh, no, no, I, I just sneezed. Oh, <laughs> well, uh, bless Excuse you. Me. <laughs> uh, so we will have further communication to community uh, in relation to uh, a survey going out, uh, as well as uh, to Sherry Lynn's earlier point uh, in relation to getting uh, this update to all of our community uh, on a more quicker basis rather. Uh, and so our teams uh, will be working on those pieces as well uh, for further follow-up. So with that being said, are there any further questions or comments? Uh, seeing or hearing none, uh, again, looking to a motion to accept uh, this community update from our connectivity and broad, broadband task force as information. Is there a mover to that? Moved by Audrey, seconder? Oh, second. Second by Carrie. Are there any further questions or comments? Seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? or hearing them, motions carried. Again, just want to say thank you and Yawa to all of the uh, task force um, members who are joined, joined us this evening. Yawa. Yeah. Okay, council, that leads us into our next uh, agenda item, uh, which is a new item uh, that was again, a mistake to be put into open. I do see Amy is with us this evening. Uh, good afternoon, or rather good evening, Amy. It's nice to see you. Uh, I know uh, Councillor, Councillor Michelle can maybe do um, maybe some background uh, to, to your issue. Uh, then perhaps maybe we can pass the floor uh, to yourself to provide any additional comments. So over to you, Michelle. Thanks, Chief. And so I brought this forward at our last council meeting in regards to mm -hmm. the concerns Amy's having in her residential neighborhood. Um, we've heard it from <laughs> Wendy Johnson, Hazel Johnson, Miller, um, in regard to the development of factories, potential zoning. And so uh, I've asked Amy to follow the process and Shirley has put her on the agenda for this evening. You have all seen her note and she comes forward with five solutions. So at this time, um, and, and we can talk to the solutions after Amy summarizes her um, document. Oh, okay, now uh, thank you for that, Michelle. Uh, again, just wanted to welcome you, Amy, to General Counsel, and I'll at this time look to pass the floor over to yourself. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to thank you for having me on tonight um, and listening to my concerns. Um, yeah, so the concern is that there is a building being constructed in my neighborhood. Um, and there was no consultation with the host neighborhood um, and it has disrupted my family's peace. Um, first, like, firstly, the land was not to be sold. So there's that. 
and I've had some issues just regarding my privacy being violated. I've asked them kindly to turn their vehicles around just because I'm not comfortable and it's nothing to do with them. I'm just not comfortable, which they have not complied. Um, so we, I did have a conversation with the proprietor and uh, he like on paper, apparently this is a garage. I haven't been able to get a business. I don't know if that's public information, but um, regardless, a garage is an industrial building. Um, and I don't feel that they belong within a residential area. Um, I took a lot of pride in knowing I was around family. Uh, I took a lot of pride knowing my, my brother's children were going to grow up around here um, and that's no longer happening. Um, going to the guidelines of this, the cannabis the guidelines, um, the like retail stores and factories are to be within less than 75 meters from a house dwelling and 150 meters from a school. This factory is within those distances to houses around here. Um, and I just feel like people are putting commercial needs before family and community needs. Our way of life is taking care of our own, taking care of our women and children and taking care of our lands. We fight this with outside of our community uh, not to invade in our, in our space. And now it's happening within. And I'm not comfortable with, I've been told like, there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do. But then I ask, so what have we done? And it's, I've heard nothing. And I'm like, well, how do we know there's nothing we can do if nothing's been done? I'm not okay with that answer because I'm not okay having to explain that to my future grandchildren. When they ask me, Grandma, why can't I drink the water? Why can't we play outside? And I'm gonna say, and I can't say because I did nothing. I was told there was nothing we could do. Um, and this is, I put a general post up and coming from the community, there's a lot of concerns. Um, Children are not allowed to play outside due to the smell, the smoke. Um, pools are turning pink due to whatever is coming out of those buildings. Gardens are being affected and we're supposed to be a self-sustaining people. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be taking care of the land. Um, trees are dying. Uh, some people can't even open their windows because the smoke comes in and sets their smoke alarms off. There's been film and residue on property and belongings. The traffic flow, the strange people coming and going, they're scared for their children's safety. The air quality, the effects on breathing, people getting asthma and cancer. There's schools, a school around the corner from me, which could be impacted if there's air pollutants. Um, flooding effects on the water table and I am myself on the well um, and the water line is going to run directly towards my house from that building. Soil contamination, pets, wildlife dying. Um, there's been people seen wear, wearing hazmat suits when getting this tobacco, um, filling swamps and drainage with concrete and other things. Again, risks of cancer, garbage being dumped, and uh, pesticides being used, uh, privacy being compromised with 24-hour security outside. That one's a personal one for me, too. Um, I have cars, like, facing directly my house, trying to watch TV or cook dinner. Lights are shining right into my house. Um, Families being divided and generational health issues. This has caused a lot of stress on myself and my family. Um, so like, where, where does it stop? How many factories are we going to have before we say enough is enough? Like when our air is so polluted that we can't go outside? 
until there's a factory on every corner. We pride ourselves on having the largest Carolinian forest, but these factories are cutting down trees and they're destroying them with the pollutants. And we are the only green space left that can be seen from space. And this is going to be jeopardized if we allow, keep allowing this, these factories. Um, we're fighting for lands. We're concerned we're not gonna have enough for future generations. Um, and we're also afraid of turning into a municipality. I get that, the bylaws, it's a hard topic, but we're going to look like one too if we keep having these buildings around. And it actually, they don't even, off the reserve, you don't even see that. You don't see a factory amongst a residential area. Um, and uh, yeah, we're just gonna run out of land for people to build, build on. My daughter was going to, going to build in front of me and she doesn't want to do that now. We don't know if it's going to even be safe. And like I said, on paper, this is a garage, but speaking with the owner, it's a smoke shop, smoke factory. Um, so what happens in that case? What happens if it's on paper, it's been approved as a garage and it turns out to be a factory? What happens? I don't, I'm not... I don't haven't had an answer for that yet through anybody is just speaking to community. I've been just told nothing. But like I said, off off the outside of the reserve, that wouldn't happen. There's a building, a house right now, a beautiful home. I think in Quebec, um, it's up and the neighbors didn't could complain because they couldn't see it blocked views. They have to tear that house down. Um, so I, I don't know, but I know the community is speaking and they are sick of it. They don't like seeing it and we're done with the, just shaking our head and saying, there goes another factory. Um, I've asked every, like people who come to me, like, what would you suggest as a solution? And they do, they don't want industry, industrial buildings factories in residential areas. They want water, soil, and air testing. Maybe even a cap on the number of factories we allow in our territory. Laws or stipulations to protect environment. And we definitely need to get more of our land back. Um, we need a rigorous environmental assessment pro process that gives neighborhoods ample opportunities to learn and comment and voice concerns. Um, in Akwesasne, they use, they've used the world view and environmental ethics, and they have included the Thanksgiving address to help with the environmental assessment process. And I've been told that it's um, working so far. Um, kind of all I have to say like so yeah where people are asking for some zoning or some kind of regulations that protect the environment our homes um I don't know where these numbers came from for how far away these buildings have to be away from dwellings in schools but um this one beside me is within that. And like I said, if that's the case, my brother can't give his land to his children now because the factory is too close. And it's disrupted um, the water usage for me. I can't, I'm on the well. Okay, hey, um, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Amy, for, for joining us this evening. And really providing uh, a really thorough, um, you know, update in terms of, you know, what our residential, you know, so not particularly everyone, but specific areas within the territory are going through. I know even councillors have spoken to this as uh, Michelle has alluded to uh, in her comments, uh, you know, basically going through the same things. 
Uh, I'll I'll open the 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 floor up for for any further questions and comments. But just just maybe even firstly starting in the conversation in relation to you know some of your solutions, uh, because that's just it, right? As much as we can can look to you know the the concerns and and the complaints and the the issues at hand, we have to come up with solutions as a community, and how community is going to be have to respect what collective uh, regardless of it's if, if it's just individual opposition to say such uh you know um i want, don't want to call them bylaws or maybe you know i know we tried uh with standards community standards that didn't fly but i think you know even in terms of that presentation you know we should really look to prioritizing certain areas so maybe it's looking to piecemeal in a sense i know at, at times piecemealing isn't ideal but you know, perhaps we look at, and I know, and maybe perhaps Nathan can 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 shed a little light as well in relation to you know his uh, he's the chair of the environment uh, committee, which was just uh, implemented uh, not too long ago in terms of accepting in terms of reference and so forth. But again, you know, I think this is this is a community. This has to be. It's a obviously community issue, but it needs to be community solved as well. And I think that's part of More. where we need to have further conversation because again. It's about the standards of, like you say, enlisted, you know, the qualities of our lands and, and waters and airways. And you make a very valid point of, you know, when we're when we're stopping, uh, you know, and looking to develop in, in surrounding communities and areas, but we're, we can't look to our own backyard. That says something as, as well. And I think that's something that we need to have further conversation. But it's it's about really even just the risk, the just the basic to me is respect for the land as well to and to neighbors you know i think it's um, it's unfortunate especially even too when we see tree cutting and so forth you know there's been some uh you know uh, owners who you know replanted and so forth items like that but again it doesn't solve the issue at hand so again just wanted to um really thank you uh for bringing forward your concerns because i know it's been an ongoing issue for many many years in this territory I, I'm I'm with you in a sense of yes, let's let's get some solutions and let's 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 test some of these items out. Like and again, you know the example that you raised uh, in the community of Akwesasne. Uh, you know I think it's we have to look at other areas and other communities and what's working and what's not working to at least start on a, on a base. You know when there's a lot of times we don't have to reinvent the wheel either. Uh, you know I'm sure you've all also uh, seen in community you know the concerns around illegal dumping. Uh, and that's been a huge, huge issue within this territory as well. So I think in, in all essence, just wanted to um, really open up with, with those comments on this conversation and we'll really look to uh, any uh, further questions or comments from any counselors on the line. I do see- I have uh, a comment, Mark. Okay, I see Nathan has his hand raised and then I'll go to Hazel and then Michelle uh, is the speaking list. So over to you, Nathan. Thanks, Chief, and, and thanks, Amy, for bringing this this um, bringing this forward because it is timely. Um, I do want to share with you that as part of the Environment Committee, um, it's it's newly formed, and we are just starting. We're we're about six months in, um, but one of the things we've been discussing is um, a, a, a concept that Darren brought forward, which is best use plans, in mm. a it's a hybrid in the best way I can really describe it it's a hybrid of zoning and and voluntary compliance um, and and the best use plan uh, kind of concept is something we want to flush out and make it a six nations solution um, in in terms of how best we can we can lay this out for the community and and also you know highlighting those principles uh, that that's um, in your in your document here uh, around, um, you know, preservation of the clan area forest and in the principles around, um, you know, good environment and a safe environment. So that's something that, that we're looking and um, to, to flush out within the next um, few weeks and actually, you know, bring that out to the community for dialogue um, to start that discussion on, on uh, how best we can come up with that solution. Um, I also want to uh, speak to one of the things we've been working forward on, and, and again, um, we have Rod uh, Whitlow with us, who uh, I've worked with for years and is an environmental expert, in my opinion, he's, he's kind of an environmental god, um, but the, 
the, the other piece is how best that we can approach a process to ensure that testing occurs, uh, as you highlighted in your solutions uh, around soil, around um, air and, and, and uh, water. Um, and, and working with um, the existing, you know, partnerships that we may have with McMaster as well as uh, the federal government to, to kind of roll that out um, in, in a process pace so that those who want to get the test will be able to get the test and, and those who need to pay for it vis-a-vis um, -vis the companies uh, will, will do that. So that's something else that, again, we're working forward on and, and flushing that out um, going forward. Um, but I just want to highlight and, and, you know, the other solutions, we're still having discussions and we want to bring those out to the community um, um, that you've highlighted as well um, in, in a way that um, we get to that concrete action at the end of the day, because I think that's important. And I think we all saw earlier this week, right? Um, I think it was the UN released their report that we're at the stage on, on climate change that there's irreversible effects. And we've known that for years, but now the scientists are actually putting the numbers and the hard data out for us to absorb. There's things we won't be able to reverse. And, and that's a hard truth that every one of us has to accept. Uh, but there are actions we can do to prevent it into the future. And that's uh, what I wanna talk about going forward in, in the work that we're doing on the environment committee. So. Um, Happy to answer any any questions. Like I said, we're we're looking to to flush this out forward, and those that are on the environment committee with me know that you know we're we're driving to get a community update out there and um, and start this discussion so we can start looking at coming up with these concrete actions going forward. Um, so, Chief, I'll, I'll leave it there, but happy to answer any further questions if, if they come forward. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nathan, for your comments. Uh, I do have a speaking list. Next on that list was Hazel. Yes, I would just like to thank Amy for bringing this forward because it's a topic that I brought forward um, earlier this year on behalf of third line residents who are all upset about uh, another additional industrial building uh, they thought was going up when there was already uh, I think there's three there already. It's really sad when um, all of the conditions of the fallout from those industrial buildings, uh, from the uh, smoke and all of the um, stuff that flies into the air. I've had people complain to me. Um, unfortunately, when I brought my situation to council, um, because they were fam some were family met or members, but the most of them were not, and they had letters as well. So um, I hope with the support of your um, information tonight, along with what came forth from Third Line, that those can be put together. Because I know at the time when we did speak about it, there was thoughts on. Um, how the Oneida Business Park was supposed to be an industrial area. And that to me would be the ideal spot where all of the uh, buildings of such would have to all be in that location. But people are just putting it on their own land and <laughs> nobody can say anything, but we do have to get control of this because it is out of control. Um, today I, I drove by my brother-in-law's lawn there on his lawn he's got a sign that says not an industrial area so this is really affecting a lot of people on reserve um people are afraid to tell their neighbor that you know i don't like what you're doing i don't want to I'm, I'm expecting another uh case to be brought forward because i see another big laneway gone in right next to the lady who complained before so I'm, I presume there will be another complaint coming forth very soon. <clears throat> it almost seems like all of the complaints that have come, though, could never be acted upon because there's no zoning bylaws here. And that's where this council needs to get, get um, some, some regulations in as fast as they can because, um, you know, we need to take care of our homeland here because it is our... It is our home and we want it to stay the way that we know it, not have smoke blowing all over the place. And 
when you talk about all of the crises that are happening in a world, just look at all those fires that are happening down in California and worst fires ever in what's happening to the planet. Now is the time for us all to take a second look and really think about what is happening and let's not be afraid to speak up. It don't matter if it's your neighbor, your friend or your family, speak up for them and tell them how you feel. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Hazel, for your comments as well. I do uh, recognize, I think Amy had her hand up, so I'll add her, uh, as well as Michelle, you're next, and Wendy. Thanks, Amy, for doing the overview. And I wanted to touch on your solutions and actually not to um, repeat, Nathan spoke to the environment, which I think we are making some, some strides with respects to water, soil and air testing, and even um, bylaws or standards to protect the environment, which we shouldn't have to, but I mean, this is a time we're in. Um, and I, I want to say it's been brought forward, industrial land for factories, but I also think we need to find that land. Um, I know council, we don't have a lot of land, it would seem. Um, so those are things that we, we need to look on. And as we've talked at a previous council meeting in regards to this, um, even community members, do you really need to sell your land? Um, is there other things you can do with your land? And so they're all in, in the works. And of course, we're always trying to look for more land to get more land back. So I really appreciate you bringing your comments forward because it's a community issue. Um, and, and I know it's impacting you down where you reside, but I know it's a, a bigger issue. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Michelle. I do have Amy next and then over to Wendy. I just wanna know like, are these businesses approved by anybody or do they just get to do them because they're self-funding them like there's no approval otherwise or so we do we do have a voluntary it's a business registration system i know in the past uh you know i think this might have been in the first maybe in the 2010s maybe it might have stopped in 2015 but uh, in in the past counselors would actually have to go out and visit these businesses to actually uh, look at their legitimacy uh, but that process changed when the business registration process changed because there was, you know, even community flack then uh, in relation to, you know, uh, council having really any any involvement in business uh, within community. But nonetheless, there are still many businesses who still volunteer and apply for the license that that we offer uh, at council. And I think it's in addition to other areas too, like finances and so forth. But, uh, you know, I think um, when it comes down to it, it's, it's really leads back to, you know, the mentality of this is my land and I'll do what I want with it, regardless of what or who tells me otherwise. So I think that's something where also community uh, needs to have conversation further on. But to answer your question, uh, we do have a registration system, but it's a, a volunteer at this time. Is that public information or not? Uh, so we looking to uh, actually, I think the best person surely to answer that question. We, yes, we can um, provide the names of the businesses to the public if they wanted to call and just verify. As long as we got the name of the business, we can confirm whether they're registered or not. Okay, so and so if th this is on paper is a garage, an auto body garage but I've been told by the owner that it's actually a factory, what happens? What See, happens in that situation? Just, just to also provide even further, you know, that there's obviously flaws within the current system as well, because, you know, I, a lot of the times when people come back to get the repeat, obviously, uh, you know, another uh, license the following year, you know, what we have to put into place, but again, that's where the, where some of the flaws lie is looking to actually go to these businesses and verify that they are what they say they are on paper. So there, there, there are many challenges even within that system itself. Um, but again, nonetheless, you know, that's something that I think in addition, council needs to have a further conversation in community as to how we want to proceed 
or move for forward even in that manner? Because like, I'm just wondering, like, if it's a factory, I don't, I don't want to live here. I don't, I don't want to live in beside a factory. So if it was approved as otherwise, do, do I get compensated? I don't know. Like, I may have to move. Um, because this is not okay for me. And, but then again, if I move, what's protecting me from it happening again? Again, yeah. Right now, there's nothing. Yeah. I, I totally, I totally understand and, and hear, uh, hear your frustration and, and questions. I do want to just really quickly, there are a few hands being raised as well. I want to shift over now to Wendy and then over to Helen. Yeah, th thanks, Mark. And Amy, thanks for your presentation. I want to thank you for the courage to bring it forward and to raise the issues. Uh, Michelle's right. I brought this up to past council, I think, 11 years ago, this same situation. You know, you put everything into a home and there's no control over what happens around you um, unless you have the money to buy up the land. And I think what Nathan brought forward with what the environmental committee is doing is, is right on target. I mean, there are solutions there, you know, what should be done. It's a process, all of those things. We, we check the boxes and doing it right. But I think we need to address the reality in the community. You know, this is a cyclical issue in terms of what the reality is here is we have large businesses who pay very large amounts of money to buy up the land and do what they want to with that land. They have the monopoly because they have the money and they can do it. I mean, we have, we, we know we hear the demands about housing. People can't find land to build a house down here because all the land gets bought up. And, you know, Michelle said it, people sell their land and whatever happens, happens to it. We don't have zoning down here whatsoever. And I, I think, the, the issue is, even if we try to do zoning, and that's the natural solution going forward, then it becomes a rights argument, a jurisdictional argument, the enforcement argument. You know, we as the elected council, the reality is we don't have the support to do that. The answer is the community. It has to be community driven. I mean, people bring it up and it gets raised but it's the community that has to come out and speak out against that. I mean, you pick any road and you see these large factories. Look at fourth line. I mean, Hazel talks about third line. Now look where I live. I mean, we all face it where Helen is. We have it all around us. And Amy's right. The way that we're going, you know, in, in this direction, there will be more large buildings down here than homes. We're not going to have the bush lots anymore because they're all being clear-cutted right now for the large buildings. That's the reality that we're in right now. So, you know, and when it comes down to, if we were to make zoning laws, if we were going to go down that, we're gonna have the big argument about jurisdiction rights enforcement, because then policing, how do you enforce that? What do you do? Do the courts recognize it? And it goes on and on and on. And then elected council will get pitted against the Confederacy, Confederacy Council. And that's, that's the cyclical issue that happens. That's our reality. So how do we overcome those things? Because they're, they're all the reality. Just, just really quickly, uh, I know Amy has her hand and I, Helen's, I have her next speaking, but I just wanted to touch on the last piece that you had mentioned, Wendy, in relation uh, to the Confederacy, you know, and that's, I think that's even part of where we community also, because there's commonalities, regardless of our differences, uh, and looking at, you know, those pieces of, of what Wendy's mentioned in terms of jurisdictional and rights and so forth, we still have commonalities, which is the environment. We still have commonalities in facing and trying to deal with, uh, you know, uh, the drug and alcohol issue. We still, we're all affected by those types of issues, uh, regardless of which, every single one of us. So looking at those types of issues, I think, is something that even as a community, we need to look to and have those hard discussions to say, well, you know, if we're going to sit here and, and have you know, opposition and, and really this infighting, that's where none of this other work gets done either. So I think, Wendy, you raise a good point in terms of actually going to the core of the issue itself as well, in terms of starting to then now tackle these other issues like the ones you're raising this evening. Uh, but I do again, I'll, I have uh, Helen up next and I'll, I'll go back over to you, Amy. 
Helen? Yeah, I just wanted to say oh, this has been a long standing issue with me for years and years and years. Because as you know, I live next door to one of the world's largest cigarette factories. Um, if you drive around the reserve, I can tell you right now, there's like three or four buildings going up on fourth line that I suspect are going to be cigarette factories. There's one going up, going to be going up on sixth line that I suspect is going to be a cigarette factory. And I'm saying suspect because that's what we're left to do. We're left to speculate the project Amy's talking about. I've heard rumors it's going to be a cigarette factory. I've heard it's going to be a warehouse. I heard it's going to be a garage. We're speculating because that's the only thing we can do because we don't know what they're doing. We can only go by what we see. And to me, that's wrong because I think this council needs to know what businesses are coming into our community. The business recognition program is mainly retail and they want the cigarette quota. All these big manufacturers building all these factories, they don't come to council to say, I want my business recognized. They don't need a cigarette quota. So that program is, is not working for this kind of a situation. So I really think we need to build some kind of a system that we, business have to come to us. And people need to remember too, this, they don't own the damn land. Nobody owns the land. It's collectively owned by all of us. And we have a right to say what is going to go, what should be going on with that land. They have no right to sit there and tell you it's none of your business. I own this land. No, you don't own it. I own it just as much as they do. And there's so many issues with these cigarette factories that people don't know about. When I when I've got got in a big fight with Grand Bear Enterprise over all the dead trees. I found out it was because they had an inadequate septic system and it was killing all the trees. How many of these cigarette factories going up or that are already up have adequate sewage systems? I'll bet you none of them. I'll bet you the sewage is all going into the ground. They, 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 they all use glue to glue the filters onto the cigarettes. I found out Grand Bear Enterprise and the reason their septic system was inadequate and wasn't working was because they were dumping at the end of the shift, the workers would dump the glue, the unused glue into the toilet, which was going into the septic system, which wrecked the septic system and it went in the ground. So there's a lot of issues with these factories that people don't know about. What are, the fa what are all these factories doing with the glue? Where are they disposing of it? Are they putting it in the ground, in the toilet? So the environment, you know, there's so many things and we really need to get a handle on it somehow. And I think this is one of the issues where the Confederacy Council should be coming forward and offering to work with council on this. Because we need the two councils on this. Wendy's right, if we try to do something, they're gonna run to the Confederacy or the Confederacy say, we don't have jurisdiction over the land. We can't tell nobody what to do. We need both councils working on this. That's the only way we're going to find a solution. I, I, you know, I applaud the Environment Committee for all the work they're going to be doing and trying to do. But when it comes to the land, the two councils need to work together on this. I don't know how we can get the Confederacy to work with us. I don't know. I remember when I tried to when I was doing the, my business with Grand River Enterprise, one of the issues I ran into, I couldn't get nobody to help me. I couldn't get the council of the day to bring the Ministry of the Environment down here to do an assessment of the land and the air and everything. I couldn't get the men's fire to help me. I couldn't get the ACC to help me. Why? Because they all had people working there. And they didn't want to see their families getting fired because the families needed the money to keep their families. So that's another issue we're running into. These cigarette places, they all provide employment. There's a lot of families depend on these cigarette places for their living. And so that gets to be another issue when you try to get people on board to help you and try to get people to do things because they all, a lot of them have families working in these places. So that was a big block that I ran into. 
Oh, thank goodness. Um, you know, Grand River Enterprise did work on fixing their septic system, but I, I couldn't get nobody to help me do anything. And I know that's what you're gonna run into with any one of these projects because they do a good they, they do good for our community because they do provide employment and they do help build our economy. The people working in the factories are spending their money at all our small businesses. So our small businesses are thriving because of this. So there's a whole big, we have to balance it somehow. That in one hand, it's not good for the community. And in the other hand, it is good for the community because you have all of these people working. That, that it, there's gotta be some kind of a balance someplace as to how we're gonna deal with all of this. And I don't know what that is, but I just know that's that's the way it is. And we, I really, really think it's important for the two councils to work together on this. I really do. I think that's the only way we're gonna find a solution. I don't know whether it's requiring to go and do a presentation to them or what, but we we have to get them on board somehow. I hope the people out there listening to me will talk to their chiefs and talk to their, their the clan mothers and let them know how important this is for our community because it is important. And, and like I said, if you, I, I, after I, I knew Amy was coming, that's what I did. I drove around the reserve and I seen all of these uh, construction projects and I'll bet any money they're gonna be cigarette factories. And we should know, the council should know what's going on in our community. We, we gotta come up with some kind of system where these people, and another concern I have too, and I know I'm going on and on, but we don't, the majority of these factories, I'll bet you any money again, are funded by non-natives. Our, our people don't have the money to do this. They come in, they get funders, non-native funders. We don't know those people. We don't know what kind of backgrounds they have. We don't know if they're organized crime. We don't know anything about them. You know, you might start raising a cane about somebody's project. You don't know what's gonna to happen to you because you don't know the people that are backing it. We know that the, a lot of the factors are being backed by non-natives. I guarantee that. I can't guarantee it, but I guarantee it because I think that's what's happening. When you see the people doing the factory, you know they don't have the money to do it. So they gotta have somebody backing them. And it's generally people from off reserve. So that's another concern because you don't know what they're gonna do. What kind of people, we don't know what kind of people's coming into our community. Sometimes you can drive around to these sites and see these big cars sitting there. Big cars that you know don't belong in our community. So that's another concern. We need to know who these people are that are doing business in our community. We need to know if they're even, the one shop on Fourth Line, somebody was telling me the guy's not even from here, making a shop, making a factory, not even from Six Nation. So and we need to know so many things. I don't know how we're gonna do it, but we have to do something. And, I, and what Amy's saying, or what Wendy, I think it was Amy, or what, what Amy's saying about what can happen, I guarantee you, I can't, there's times I can't open my windows because all I can smell is cigarettes and it's really strong. There's dust blowing in the air. I went outside one time and I bought brand new white sneakers, thinking my sneakers were really ace. I walked around for a little while and they were all brown. The toes were just brown. So that's telling me tobacco is going into my, it's in the air and it's coming into my property on my, my grass. And, and if I leave my window open, it's coming in my window. So there's all kinds of different things like that, that that's happening. And, and, and Amy's right, there's all kinds of things. My, my neighbor was in the bush one day digging a hole in the bush and it was full of poop. The bush, in the bush, it came, oh, nothing came out but poop <laughs> coming from next door to a factory. So 
it's there's a lot of stuff I could go on and on and on and on because I've lived with it so long but I just want to warn council that, that I don't know what we can do but we have to do something I just don't know what to be honest with you <laughs> Well, thank you. Uh, That's my rant. That's my rant. <laughs> thank you so much, Helen, for, for your comments. Uh, obviously, it's well known. Uh, you, you have lived with uh, these types of experiences for some time. So again, it just stems to, again, you're right. I think the fact of it's got to be community driven and it's got to take everyone involved, including the two councils, to figure out how we're going to move forward. Because again, if we get into bylaws and all those pieces and some of the barriers and challenges that Wendy had alluded to in relation to enforcement and jurisdictional and rights and so forth. You know, are we getting into bylaws and then next thing you know, we're turning ourselves into a municipality. And like, that's the last thing that we want here, but we should at least have standards and how, you know, we treat each other and our neighbors. So I know Amy has had her hand up for quite some time. So I'm going to check in with Amy, then I'll go over to Audrey. And I also just want to check in with uh, Rod. Oh, I see Sherry Lynn as well. Um, so uh, that being said, Amy, you have the floor. Um, so I wanted to go back to, I, I, there was something saying it's going to take time. There's lots we have to figure out, but I mean, this huge guideline seemed, we, we have this for the cannabis. I'm not sure why we don't have one for our living and residential and industrial. I don't, I'm not sure. I know it's got some points in there. Like I've highlighted them, how many meters and such between buildings and homes. Um, so um, I don't know. Yeah, there's a lot of work and I don't know, but like, but, and I have gone to the Haudenosaunee Council on this matter as well. Um, they've agreed too, this is an issue. And um, I think it's been said before the first step for the councils to work together is that the band council you have has you your only the administrators like we have to listen this is what the people want they want the hcc to be the governing body we listen and we administrate how that goes forward that's what the people want um and again, for the people, like I, I've heard that from both too. The people have to speak. It's the, up to the people. But what does that mean? What does that mean? Does that mean I gather my family up and I go over there and stop this? Because that's what we want to do. We want to stop this. We don't want this here. So do we go over there and stop it and everyone's going to support that? We're with no interference and they have to listen to us? Well, I don't know what that means when it's up to the people because we're speaking. Maybe it's, it's not just me. Maybe it's 300 people. Maybe it's a thousand, but how many, what, I don't know what that means. The people have to speak because we are. Um, but again, we get told there's nothing you, we can do. And, but I'm here saying that that's not, that's not okay. Not okay anymore. And we do have to work together. We have the two row wampum. We have to figure this out. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Amy, for your comments as well. Again, I think you, you've touched on, an, on a number of other items as well in relation to governance. You know, we have to, if that's what the, you know, that's part of the, the, the problem, I think. Is, is power, we have to eliminate the power control in titles and attitudes and egos. All of those have to get out of the room in order to allow the space for the people to speak and to bring forward those issues. If that's what like the governing question has, that's been the, you know, part of the fight for all of our existence, basically, in a sense of internal fighting. So, I mean, we've touched on a, on a number of areas and I, uh, I do have, again, a speaking list uh, but I want, before I go to Audrey, you know, I just want to uh, look to, you know, as we move forward, and that was part of the reason in relation to even the cannabis law building this in, because we knew, we know the work ongoing with the environment committee as well, and what their goals and outcomes are on that piece, uh, as well as the, you know, looking at the, 
I'm going to bring up the illegal dumping issue again, because we know that there's areas that we can, you know, again, not reinvent the wheel, but look to certain processes that are in place. And you've mentioned one again, uh, uh, you know, that work. And so we don't have to go off and do all of this, you know, due diligence when we can start from a base anyways and see what that looks like. So again, there's been a number of uh, solutions and discussions, a matter of action. I think we have to really just uh, coordinate ourselves, organize ourselves and put those words into action. Uh, Audrey? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Amy. That was uh, really, really uh, good words that you spoke. And I agree with uh, my colleagues and the committee members who have asked their questions. I, th I think that it is HCC working together with us. What it will take, we keep reaching out. And uh, all we can do is just keep reaching out. I think it's also that of people standing up. But in order to do that, I think people have to know the issues. So I think we have to educate our community of what is actually happening here. Because when you, they drive by, I don't know if they know what's going on. So if we could do that, and I think that when we have meetings like this where community members come and speak to us, I think that we can't let this go. We have to map this out and we have to keep on top of it, whether it's at our regular meetings and we keep bringing it back to the council table so that it's a collective um, complaints that have been occurring over the last uh, years that I've been on the council. So let's roll them all together. Let's get a solution going. And I'm glad we have our environment uh, committee now that can, can do some of this. And we've got Rod Whitlow working with us, which is quite wonderful. But I think that we also need to get the guidelines going as well. And we do have to have, whether you want to call them standards or zoning, people have to be able to live in an area where they're free from uh, anything that's a carcinogen that, that could cause cancer or any other kind of debilitating disease. So thank you for sharing, Amy. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Audrey, for your comments as well. I'm gonna check in with Sherry Lynn. Uh, and then also, if I can, I don't wanna put Rod on the spot, but I did see his camera come on and off there for a minute. So I'll check in with Rod as well. Uh, Sherry Lynn, you have the floor. Um, yeah, I agree with everything that's being said. I just wanted to mention that um, we keep talking about them or, and I guess that's the factory owners. I said, it's the part to the part now um, why don't we talk with them? I say this is because last term we talked with gas station owners on different issues. So maybe this will help um, to working together to talk about um, the community's concerns, um, coming up with solutions together because we keep sitting there bouncing this ball back and forth since I've been here and even before that is what I hear. So there needs to be, um, I know we're doing stuff for environment, but I think also too is um, for them to have a say and get this moving quicker than than it has been, I guess. And and thank you, uh, thank you, Sherilyn, for for bringing that suggestion forward. Because again, Amy, I, I know it's probably not the answers you entirely want to hear, and nor we have to all understand the reality that this issue is not going to be fixed overnight. However, if we can look to a plan of action and how we're going to get there, and I think that's a great suggestion in terms of you know collectively working together uh and looking to you know the the owners the, obviously those who would be willing uh to to sit down and meet uh with us on these these types of issues and concerns but again nonetheless i do also agree with audrey of, of having this as a standalone item because we can't let this go but there again as you can imagine much like everyone else's daily lives you know things do happen to uh, fall through the cracks at times but again even with council and prioritizing a number of priority one issues you know we need to also recognize the reality of you know we have two years less left to our term what can we accomplish in all reality as opposed to trying to accomplish all and put out little fires across the board which we're not going to see big huge impacts so i think those are some of the other decisions uh and st strategies really that we need to lay out uh, what is the reality in the time frame that we have to accomplish some of these big ticketed items? Uh, I do see Rod uh, on camera, and I want to just give opportunity uh, for any comments that Rod may uh, have as well. Yeah, uh, good evening, everyone. And I know this is a big topic, and we're probably getting to the end of the night and the agenda, but um, it's something that I've been working on for most of my career in terms of how to make good environmental decisions towards sustainable development across uh, First Nations territory. So um, I'm, I've been working on a neighborhood campaign and uh, I've, I've had opportunities to meet with Amy as well. And there's other 
hotspot issues across across the reserve that are are looking for solutions. I know um, I, we we did men, I think Wendy mentioned um, the the whole rights and the jurisdiction and the enforcement um, matter. Um, so voluntary compliance is a big thing that that we heard last year, last summer. Myself and Clint King did try to convene some focus group discussions with members from the community, and we know that we when we call the police to to our own police to to deal with some of these complaints from the neighborhoods. Um, they're not equipped with, with uh, knowledge, I guess, of federal regulations that actually do apply on reserve. Um, so the, the gist of the, the discussion that we had last summer was as a community, we have to make a decision as to whether we're gonna meet or exceed um, best practices and, and best uh, based on science from other jurisdictions, whether that's the province or the, the federal government or other jurisdictions. So that might be a starting point, but again, uh, myself and uh, a few others, or, or Amy, I, I was at the Longhouse as well on, on Saturday, so it was good to hear uh, the Confederacy Chiefs um, elevate this issue as, as well. They mentioned the fact that at, at some point in our, our recent history, we did have the Haudenosaunee Environmental Task Force. It's, it's similar, I guess, to what we're trying to do with the, with the, um, the Elected Council Task Force, but there were delegates on there, and, and they do bring up um, cross-cutting issues that are affecting a lot of our communities in terms of how do, how do we go for it with uh, sustainable development in a peaceful way. One of the issues that I think keeps coming up is, uh, and, and it was because uh, I, I dealt so much in my career with um, mining projects in Northern Ontario, um, and you have proponents come by and then you have the two government bodies, uh, Environment Canada and the province saying, well, we don't get involved in the negotiation of impact benefit agreements. That's between the First Nation and the proponent. So I, I, I did mention that there is a toolkit out there. It was, it was developed by a, a, a non-government non organization to help in that matter. But again, it gets to the whole, the, the base of it is how to make environmental decisions. So when, when a new development comes in, in a territory, we only have 5% of our, 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 our original tract here. Um, it's very important as Amy and others and other mothers and grandmothers have pointed out is that it's, it's getting to a critical point where we, we're not going to be able to turn back. There's a lot of clear cutting, a lot of development. We don't know who the partners are, if they're 51% native owned. Um, so there's all these types of issues. So um, I just wanted to share that because um, I, am, I am trying to do my best to work with uh, the environment delegates at uh, the Confederacy. So we've, we've had quite a few meetings and Michelle's been at some of those. And I think that's where we're going to get a lot of traction because there's, as, as you point out, um, Chief Mark, is that there's a there's a lot of, uh, um, I guess, uh, consensus around the fact that we need to we need to do a better job protecting the environment, and in th in this issue, well, if we want to promote, if we collectively want to promote sustainable development projects, then um, we have to look at mechanisms where there's open, you have a rigorous environmental assessment um, regime as, as Amy mentioned, and whereby you have the opportunity for neighborhoods and community members to hear about the proposed project and that you, you get assurances that um, we're going to exceed or we're gonna meet or exceed other, th those permits and regulations in other jurisdictions. So if there's gonna be a lot of noise, air, dust, there's gonna be light pollution, if there's gonna be, and so you, you, have, you have that process in place, mind you, it, it, it takes a long time to go through that process. Sometimes they'll put um, permits and approvals on, a, on a, an environmental registry for 30, 60 days and wait for the, common, the comments from the public to come back. And then they'll say, okay, the director of, will say there's too many concerns that the proponent hasn't demonstrated how they're going to mitigate it. So we're going to go to a, a comprehensive environmental assessment now. So that delays the project. Whereas on First Nations, because there's all these environmental reg regulatory gaps, you can find proponents and uh, partners that are that have deep pockets, and away they go. They don't have to. They don't have to go get approval from anyone. They have. They they feel that they have a certificate of possession. It's the Minister of Indian Affairs, I guess, or, and then they away they go. So there's all of these these types of issues that are at, at the backdrop. But I I I just wanted to acknowledge um, the the compassion and the respect to to Amy and to other mothers and grandmothers across the community that have approached me with some similar con concerns throughout the territory. And, and I'm, I'm here to, to help whatever I can do to help contribute to trying to find a solution. And I know there's other champions as well that are very passionate about this topic. So I'll just leave it at that. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Rod, for providing uh, such valuable comments. I do also want to go back and shift over to Amy. I see Amy has her hand raised, and as well as follow up with a community um, question or suggestion. Um, again, I just want to know, like, so what happens right now? What yeah. happens going forward today? Um, like, do I just have to live with this? Can can they be halted until we figure this out? Like, I don't, I don't know, because I know my family does not want this here. My entire family, it's not just me. I'm the only one that's going, saying something, but I have them all behind me. Um, this isn't okay for us. So just that. So I, uh, I don't know. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, Amy, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just, I just wanted to ask a question. So have you had any conversation with the actual property owner? Yes, I have. And so those conversations have now fell through. Is that my understanding? We weren't consulted with from the family that, that sold the land. It all of a sudden was just happened and we were told it was a garage. Um, and then I found out um, that it was a factory because um, my children were asked to work there. Um, so I was kind of like, okay. Um, but like I said, I had concerns with the security. Turn around. That's all I asked. Kindly. I went over there myself. Can you just turn around, please? Like, it's just uncomfortable, unsettling. I walked out of my house and it doesn't help my house. I angled my house a little bit. So they are essentially my front yard um, through the kitchen window. I see their light shining in. So I've asked, can you please turn around? And um, he came and spoke with me and he said, how are you going to feel when I have sprinter vans in and out of here all the time? And that's when I said, why, what are you building? And he said, a smoke factory. So I've heard from him, that's what it is. And, but I hear from like, I don't know, it's then I, from the family that it's a garage. Either way, they're both industrial. And uh, it should not be in a residential. This was given to us by our grandfather and his wishes were for it to stay in Miller, the Miller name. It was for our children to have homes, his grandchildren, great grandchildren, great great grandchildren to live and build homes. Um, and that hasn't been honored. So, like, yeah. Um, and then my aunt spoke about the selling of it, and they were just met with disrespect. So, it's that's why I included in the concerns as family division. And that's not our way. It's not, that's not who we are. We do have to work together. We have to live together. And I'm not against people making money. I'm not against people becoming entrepreneurs. But you need to consider the people around you. And there was no consultation, none. I had my water tested and I'm not, I don't know. I can't say where it's from, what it came from, but it's not good. My water is not good. I just got the results today. And my water is contaminated, heavily contaminated. Um, we can't drink it. My dogs got sick. I've had dogs since I've lived here and my dogs have never gotten sick and they've been sick. And another, oh, no, I, I don't go with that. But yeah, so my dogs do get sick and I don't know if it's just the building it up. Like, I don't know, I can't really say for sure. There's maybe other factors, so. I don't, I don't want to say for sure that's what it's from because that's just speculation. So just uh, again, I, I want to, because I, I can obviously understand and, and hear your, your concern and frustration. And I want to get to obviously solutions and next steps. So I think there's also like a multi-prong approach that we can take here. Um, I'm not sure if, if this will be any of assistance, but perhaps maybe even the chief's office can reach out directly to the property owner. Uh, as well as yourself, maybe even uh, kind of convene in in further discussions, um, you know, from to help in the immediate need. 
Um, I think also when I say about the multi-pronged approach, there, you know, I'm going to look to also Nathan as their chair of our environment committee. And I don't want to just seem as if I'm passing uh, this the buck or, or, or whatnot, but looking to at least do more due diligence and explore this issue in its entirety. I know there's one uh, comment in the chat from Facebook is, can the Environment Committee put together a presentation of the harmful effects these factories are having on our environment and get to further educate our people? So it sounds like we have to do a little bit more work over there, but in, in relation to the bigger picture of things, uh, you know, we really now have to get into this discussion on how we're moving forward with whether it's zoning or, or you know, standards, whatever we're calling it, uh, you know, and if we can leave this as, uh, you know, for the bigger ticketed item um, on stand, really standalone agenda items so that we don't lose focus on, on this uh, issue. But I, I, I kind of see simultaneously uh, multiple approaches to this, both in the short term, immediacy uh, into long term. Um, and so, you know, that's that's what I am gathering from our conversation thus far and where we could be of assistance and try to at least uh, look to the immediate need uh, in the short term and also look to, again, the more longer term and where we have to, uh, what we have to do to gain further support in terms of what the community is saying. Uh, Mark, I'd like to be on, on your list, Melba. Sure, sorry, uh, Melba, I do, uh, you're, you're the only one on the list, so you have the floor. Okay, great. Um, uh, I'll be quite quick because we got to get to, as uh, Nathan has said, concrete action. I wanted to say to Amy, I, I certainly thank you for coming forward as others have. You got great strength and uh, to come forward, courage. I certainly identified with you in your emotions, and I could hear it in other people's voices also, that we have, an, you know, this difficult situation that's come forward, and as Helen has mentioned and others, this is not new to us, but we haven't been taking concrete action, as Nathan has said. So what it's doing is what I understand. It's interfering. You've explained it quite well in your healthy, safe way of living. You've mentioned health, you've mentioned land use, non-community members, you know, strangers, safety of the children in the yard, pets. It just goes on and on and on. And then others, as yourself, have already uh, did a presentation for uh, council, HCCC, and Wendy has mentioned that also. And so has Helen and others. So I think that's some of the steps that needs to be taken. The governance of, of, of our community, our divisions have to be put aside for the sake of the community. We don't want any more deaths and that's what we're going to have eventually. I know other things like drugs, that's almost immediate, but this is like a slow death on our people if we continue to not put zoning or other areas in place that protect the safety of our people. So I'm ready to certainly say that we should be contacting the, the Confederacy and inviting them to come together to discuss the environmental issues affecting our healthy and safe way of living. And I hear you loud and clear to say that's what you want. You want freedom, you want family close by, and the way things are working out here, it's not going to, uh, going to happen. Uh, we don't want people moving away. I have had a son say that when it comes to break-ins in the village of Ashwigan in the past. You know, I, I think I just wanna move away because this is not a, not a good community. And I think we have to certainly work at it and uh, put our barriers down and, and as people have said tonight, many, many words in that direction. Let's all come together and work at this together and even have, have meetings as, as someone said, we did it in other areas, bring them forward, bring these people forward. I think a lot of things at times doesn't come to their awareness and education as Sherry Lynn and I pointed out 
at our last environmental meeting, we need, just as you've done tonight, Amy, education and awareness. That's what you've done tonight, loud and clear tonight. So I think we need to do some of those things uh, with the HCC as well as uh, the groups themselves. Do we need another protest? Do we need other protests? That's what's happening in our community. Is that what it's gonna to come to before we realize the environmental issues that affect our people? So I'll stop right there and, and allow Mark to continue. Thank you for listening to me. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Melba, for your comments as well. Again, this has been a very wholesome discussion and I'm sure, you know, uh, this uh, as large as this issue is, I'm sure we can go on for, for much longer, but I, I agree that we need to get into concrete action like um, um, Melba and Nathan have, have alluded to. It's about setting up that plan and actually strategizing to what the end goal and outcome can be through this issue. So we've mentioned a lot of solutions this evening. I think it's something that you know, a few we can take forward and, and actually move on. And so I think those are some of the, the pieces that we're looking forward to, you know, environment and full council and so forth, as well as community to assist in those solutions. Because again, this has to be community collective in terms of moving this entire issue forward in the long term. I'm, I'm speaking more long term, Amy, uh, not necessarily the immediate, but can definitely look to areas of, of moving forward in the immediate need as well. Uh, I see Michelle had her hand up and I'll shift back over to Amy and I'm going to start to wrap this conversation up as I'm just recognizing the time as well. Michelle, you have the yep. floor. And so for something tangible we can do, can we ask for a legal opinion on what homeowners can do? Um, if, well, knowing that Amy's groundwater is contaminated, um, can we get that legal opinion and bring that back in the next, for the next council meeting? That's something we can do along with the environmental movement that we are making, but I, but I do know there's work that needs to be done. I think that's also another great suggestion, Michelle, and uh, we can definitely look to, to that area as well, just to, uh, again, further provide some support and immediacy. Um, I'll look over now to Amy uh, for any maybe closing comments or remarks, or if there's anything further. Um, yeah, I wasn't going to mention this, but I, I think I have to, like, I wasn't going to out of maybe fear, but yeah, I think maybe you spoke about a mediation between me and the owner. Um, after Longhouse, he was outside waiting for me. Well, I'm, this is my point of view. His point of view is different, but my point, he was, because I, I heard comments. He didn't say I'm right directly to my face. So this situation has escalated. Um, I did videotape the dumping that was happening there that day from the road. I wasn't on anybody's property. I went over to my brother's, which is right beside his, the property there. I videotaped what was being dumped. Um, and when I was driving to go drive away, he had come up and tried to block me on the road. Um, he pulled, drove right at me and blocked me on the road um and then yeah so it's 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 escalated so that's why i'm just but on his side he denied saying anything to me um so yeah like my my security is a huge issue for me right now my family um so like i do i really need the leaders to come together because and maybe this is why nobody else spoke out. I don't, I don't know. Like, yes, the leaders need to come together. Something needs to be done. Cause this is, it's not okay. I should not be subjected to this. Like, that's not our way either to come and intimidate a woman because she's speaking up for her family. It's not okay. Well, thank you again, Amy. I, I do. I I I, uh, I I I hear you, and I, I again, I'm very sorry uh, that this has escalated to what it is currently. But you know what we're trying to do is 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 help as well. So if if I can, or if our office can play any role of you know some type of 
you know, respectful dialogue or conversation in terms of, you know, mediating or, or whichever, uh, you know, will by all means be happy to do so uh, to at least assure, you know, safety and security. Because again, you're right, that shouldn't be happening regardless in our community. You know, I think that's the other piece that this community needs to look at is just the way we treat each other, <laughs> period. Uh, and I think that's something that is a bigger conversation that could be happening in this community and how we should be supporting each other even further. So I, again, you know, I, I, I hear you and I, I'm very sorry to hear uh, that you've had to endure this type of situation and it should never ever come to where, you know, safety and security is an issue and, and fear and terrified to be able uh, you know, to speak out on these types of issues. So you're right, you, you know, the leadership, our community, we need to come together. We need to figure this out once and for all. And I think, you know, with our with our team and with plans, if you can give us time in the long-term picture to start and, you know, look at how we can further best move forward on this issue. But again, like I say, in the immediate need, uh, I can definitely reach out to you off the line um, and see how, we, how our office can be able to be a best of support in, in the now. Uh, Helen? Yeah, I just have a question of Amy. Um, when you went to the ACC, the Longhouse meeting, isn't they talked about it and they had an environmental committee? Did they say they had an environmental committee? I, I think I think that was actually coming from Rod. Yeah, Rod had oh, mentioned Rod, the, the Rod, environmental task. They have an environmental committee, Rod? Uh, yeah, they mentioned... Uh, uh, Chief Alan McNaught mentioned that they did at one point have delegates that from Grand River that were on the Haudenosaunee Environmental Task Force. But yeah, oh. there are there are some yeah there are delegates um, that are working on environment issues right now, and so we um, we we've, we've met. So with did they did people. he say whether this environment committee would have anything to do with Amy's situation? Um, we had a we had a, a a terrible thunderstorm, so I I didn't actually hear the outcome of the of the final decision oh. across across the floor there in the longhouse on Saturday, but it, it sounded like uh, they were going to reconvene in a couple of weeks and and, um, and talk about a number of these types of issues. It sounds like they do have a, a kind of a subcommittee uh, uh, that deals with, um, there, de there was some other issues brought up around night hunting. And so it's, this environment- well, maybe uh, we should- Yeah, come up again. Maybe one of our actions is to find out who this environmental committee is and see if we can't talk to them maybe. It might work. I don't know who it would be. Yeah, we have a point person that we've been meeting with. It's Todd Williams. So Todd is with HDI. So that's who that's who oh. the, the Confederacy Chiefs have delegated to kind of be the point person for making faces. <laughs> making faces when you mention HDI. Be well, I think something to look at. I don't know. I'm just trying yeah. to think of something. I think again, nonetheless, we 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 have to you know look at the the core issue, right? If we're ever if that's the if that's what's stopping us from working together is the acknowledgement of who's the governing body, then like we need to make that decision once and for all, in order for us to work on common issues. Like I I just get it's it's I frustrating. Agree. I, it's so frustrating to see so many missed opportunities in this community because of all the infighting. We all see it, we all do it, we're all a part of it, but we're also gonna be a part of the solution and how we fix it. So again, if that's, the, if that's what it takes, and I think it's about time, long overdue to have that hard discussion and make that decision and let's move forward for once and right. for all. Okay, well, Amy, again, I, you brought a very, uh, you know, uh, sensitive and emotional issue forward i want to thank you again i can definitely i, I can hear uh you know the frustration the emotions are high i don't want you to feel unsafe especially within your own home and especially within your own community and i think you know if we can be of any assistance in the in the now uh what i'll do is is reach out to you uh my office and maybe we can have a conversation off the line and see where we can best uh support in the now but in the in the meantime as well uh, I think, you know, we have to approach the situation uh, both on a medium and long term uh, strategy and how what we can further do to really solve this issue once and for all. I'm not sure if that's, uh, it's probably not the best answer that you're, you're wanting, uh, 
but it's it's I believe what I can best offer at this time as again it's it's there's much due diligence needed as well in the entire issue. We could also look to a legal opinion like Michelle had suggested. Again, I can have further conversation with you off the line uh, and again, how to best move forward uh, with this issue. Okay, Council, uh, that being said, uh, I don't want to just uh, really uh, put a motion as information. I'm wondering if we can maybe put some action into a motion. I don't want to just say, you know, accept Amy's uh, presentation as information. I'd rather much maybe look to see if we can include a motion that you know, starts the work uh, uh, of the Environment Committee, uh, whether we look to uh, Sherry Lynn's suggestion of bringing in all of the you know, willing factory owners uh, to have, a, again, a more wholesome discussion. Uh, we can do the in-house in pieces in terms of legal opinions, as well as, again, looking to try to mediate any situation, the situation and, and to the own property or owner. So we can do all of those pieces that we can also write to the Confederacy. So I don't just really looking at council to see if there's any um, anyone willing rather to put some action behind a motion in relation to follow up to this issue. Uh, Nathan. Chief, I'll, I'll move that motion in terms of um, highlighting the work at the Environment Committee, which was discussed, um, highlighting the work that uh, you committed to in terms of the follow up and the mediation uh, and the legal opinion. I'll put that forward. Okay, thank you uh, for that, Nathan. And again, we'll also look to uh, further updates. Is there a seconder to that motion? Uh, second by uh, Michelle. Are there any further questions or comments? And again, I think this is going to be an ongoing communication strategy as well with full community, uh, and and where as well full community can be a part of the of the outset of this conversation and be a part of the solution. Um, so. Any further questions or comments? I see Wendy. Yeah, can we just rephrase that, that we're gonna develop a concrete plan on how to address this issue with um, business and enterprise building in the community within the infrastructure, short-term and long-term, and include then the following pieces that Nathan just stated? Yeah, sure. I'll look to the mover if that's okay with the mover and seconder. Sounds great. Okay, seconder, Michelle. Good. Okay, so, and I'll also, we can work with, uh, surely I can work with you as well to list all those pieces that uh, that uh, Wendy had just mentioned in terms of follow-up. Is there any further questions or comments? Seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motions carried. Motion to waive second reading? I move. Moved by Nathan, seconder. I'll second. Second by Michelle, all in favor. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing that motions carried. Uh, in the meantime, Amy, I'll be, uh, my office will be reaching out uh, hopefully at some point tomorrow, if not the next day. Okay, thank you. Okay, now and thank you for joining us. Have a good evening. Uh, okay, Council, uh, that leads us into our next agenda item, which is the adoption of the General Council Minutes of July 13th. Is there a mover moved by Sherry Lynn, second by Helen? Are there questions, comments? Seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motions carried. That leads us now into scheduling. We do have there's a, the Six Nations Gaming Commission has a policy meeting in Niagara Falls that needs a recommendation for Councillor Sherry Lynn uh, to attend. Looking for a mover to that effect. Moved by Audrey, move second by Melba. Oh, second by Michelle. Thank you, Melba. Moved by Audrey, second by Michelle uh, to approve uh, our delegate, Councillor Sherry Lynn Hill Pierce, to attend the Six Nations Gaming Policy Retreat in Niagara Falls, Ontario, from September 10th to the 12th of 2021. Um, any further questions, comments? Seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motions carried. Can I get a motion to waive second reading? Moved by Audrey, seconder? Yep. Second by Michelle, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motions carried. 
Uh, just in relation to scheduling as well, tomorrow we have the Building and Infrastructure Committee following the next week, which is General Finance on the 16th, as well as Corporate Emergency Services uh, on Wednesday, the August 18th, uh, as well as our upcoming follow-up retreat, uh, which is scheduled for August 24th to the 26th. Uh, there's obviously other meetings in between per counselor in each files, uh, but these are all, uh, the main uh, committees within council. Um, that being said, uh, let me just look to my... I would like to now look to, oh, sorry, finishing the, the last of the last week of August, we have political liaison uh, on Monday, the 23rd as well as our follow-up general council to this month on August 24th at 6 p.m. all, which are live stream. Also coming up, and maybe we can just pause really quickly, uh, uh, the bread and cheese event on the 27th, that's gonna wrap up Community Awareness Week. As community knows, we are currently in Community Awareness Month, and we're gonna be wrapping that up at, at the 27th towards the end of the month, but maybe if I could just pause really quickly um, and look to Shirley and Tammy just to provide maybe a quick uh, overview or snapshot on what this year's festivities will look like in relation to bread and cheese. I know there's been many conversations happening within community uh, in relation to uh, recovering our children in the residential schools and so forth. And should we still even be celebrating this? But uh, our goal is really looking at it from post pandemic uh, and really being able to uh, uplift a community uh, and to really be able to control the narrative. And so that's something that we also wanna dedicate bread and cheese to is, uh, all of our children and survivors and so forth. So continuing to keep that awareness and the color orange loud and clear uh, over the next weeks and months to come. Um, so again, just wanna stop and pause and maybe stop with Shirley, uh, just to provide a quick overview of what bread and cheese festivities planning is looking like. Shirley, are you there? Oh, sorry, I just wish, uh, sent the chat to Tammy. I thought maybe she could take care of it for us. Okay, so, well, I can check in with Tammy too, if you would like Tammy to provide. It, well, it's okay, just for time's sake. It's, um, we've got, um, at, presently, we've, um, we've got two locations that are, uh, we'll be using for the drive-through. Um, it'll start at 11 a.m. on Friday, August 27th, and finish up at 2 p.m. on Friday, August 27th at 2.30. Excuse me. Sorry. At 2.30, the live draw will be taking place at the gathering place, whereby we'll be dra drawing the five names with the stamp completed stamp sheets for the five theme packages. Theme packages are uh, a variety of, we do entertainment packages, uh, a family theme package, a sports package, um, a barbecue package, and a camping package that will be available. Um, with regards to the drive through, we're going to have it set up. So we are, um, Chief and Council, you, you will be taking the lead on this and handing out the bread and cheese. We've uh, strategically placed it at both the gathering place and the community hall because of the fact that they do have the coolers there in hopes of keeping the bread and cheese cooled while you are distributing it. And um, both locations have enter and exits. One challenge that we're coming up with and which we're going to hope have resolved is the fact that at the community hall, the COVID center is also located there. So um, there's a little bit of concern with the ECG with us having it in the parking lot at the community hall. Um, but I was hoping that we could be far enough away from the um, COVID center. I was looking at um, hoping we could have it along where the skateboard park is. Um, driving in from fourth line and um, entering in from fourth line and exiting at Lawrence Jonathan um, uh, just to kind of help with the traffic. Um, so um, we've ordered bread and cheese the same amount that we had as last year. Um, we're recruiting volunteers right now. I put out an email to SAT um, to just let them know that, you know, with regards to how they're going to coordinate it with staff being able to drive through whatever and however that works out. I've also put an email out to the volunteer firefighters to see if we can recruit 
help to um, help assist with um, in case you know there's need for um, because carrying the bread and the cheese from the freezers outside, we want to keep it as cool as possible, right? So I'm not sure if we might have missed any type of logistics. If they if we have, please be sure to let me know, and we'll make sure that we cover that. And um, yeah, so we're looking forward to it. And um, thank you, Chief and Council, for um, taking this um, on for the community. And I think all the people are excited to get their bread and cheese this year. And so, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Shirley, for providing that really uh, quick overview on the planning. Again, there's still some logistical pieces, and I'm sure we'll be getting all communication out to community. So it's, uh, you know, once it's uh, on concrete plan, we'll get that distributed to community. So everyone is well aware of the process and how and what it will look like this year. Um, just want to check in and see if there's any questions or comments. If not, I want to shift right in. I, uh, Christopher is on the line for, uh, we have number seven on the political updates. I just wanted Christopher, and I know uh, Helen has brought forward um, some areas in terms of impacts on different uh, bills. Uh, so for example, Bill C-15 and so forth, as well as uh, the election, possible election coming up uh, in writ and so forth. Uh, so I have asked Christopher to provide just really quickly high level updates on some of the items uh, that uh, our office has been working on. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Chief. Um, so I'll try to keep it uh, fairly brief. There are two or three items that I'll, I'll just give a brief update on. There should be two uh, briefing notes that uh, that were in the shared folder. Uh, I was having trouble accessing it earlier, so I'm not sure if it's been sent around yet, but if it hasn't yet, uh, they will be soon. Um, first up, uh, C-15, which is now uh, the UNDRIP Act. Um, there have been a number of questions about this, and uh, the briefing note goes into it in further depth. Uh, but just uh, sort of a high-level overview, um, it goes over the history of uh, legislation, starting with uh, the development of UNDRIP back in 2007, uh, the government's aspirational endorsement of it in 2010, uh, a series of private members bills that were put forward between 2008 and 2019, uh, the unqualified endorsement in 2016 by the federal government, and finally the government bill C-15, which was introduced in December of 2020, and which received royal assent in June of 2021. Uh, so that is now law. Uh, and there have been a number of questions about what this means uh, and a number of misconceptions. Uh, so uh, just to sort of state it as succinctly as possible, uh, the new law does not change anything immediately with regards to Six Nations of the Grand River or its relations with the federal or provincial government. Um, it does not uh, treat Six Nations as a municipality. Uh, it does not create uh, any new tax on Six Nations. Uh, it does not impose any new law, regulation, or policy on Six Nations. Uh, by and large, it's a uh, an affirmation of the principles of UNDRIP, um, but it's important to note that it does not automatically or immediately import them directly into Canadian law. Uh, the main purpose of, of the bill, uh, which was known as C-15 and is now known as the UNDRIP Act, uh, is to affirm UNDRIP as a universal international human rights instrument with application in Canadian law and to provide a framework for its implementation as such. So what this does is it sets out some measures that the government is bound to take, which include uh, consultation and cooperation with Indigenous peoples to ensure that Canadian laws are consistent with UNDRIP. Now, uh, this particular consultation and implementation process does not have a timeline. There is a timeline of two years for the development of an action plan. So the law mandates that the federal government develop an act action plan oriented towards implementing under its principles and the federal government is uh, legally bound legally obliged to present that plan to parliament within two years of it having received royal assent uh, so by june 21st 2023 um, the action plan must be designed to address injustice prejudice violence and racism promote mutual respect and understanding and monitor and facilitate UNDRIP implementation in Canadian law. But that particular consultation and implementation process is ongoing. So there's, there's not a two-year timeline on that. 
And then in addition to that, it mandates annual reports um, at the end of each fiscal year to be presented by the uh, minister designated uh, to part. Um, UNDRIP can be invoked by the courts. The AFM has noted that it has already been used by Canadian courts when examining Canadian international obligations. Uh, and this will now likely become a factor in more purely domestic decisions as well. Uh, even the preamble, which contains the most uh, affirmatory language about UNDRIP, um, uh, while of less effect than the main operative text of the law, can also be cited by courts as providing general direction as to the legislator's intent. Um, the briefing note contains some extensive commentary by various people. Uh, the AFN was consulted and have been strongly supportive, um, uh, as have most federal politicians, uh, clearly, as it was passed by a strong margin. Um, there are also some concerns uh, reported and explained. Uh, there were some questions about how it would work. Uh, there were some concerns about it being mostly symbolic. Uh, there were some concerns about um, it being explicitly subject to the Canadian Constitution. There were some concerns about how it might impede large Canadian development projects, and also some concerns about its negative impact on the ability of First Nations communities to give consent to and benefit from development. Uh, so that's kind of just a general overview of, uh, of C-15. And of course, there's a lot more detail in that briefing note. Um, and that's it for that. So um, if there's any questions, happy to answer them. Otherwise, I'll move on to the next item. Okay. Oh, I see Nathan has uh, his hand up. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Great, great overview, and I look forward to reading the briefing note. Um, two things just done for right at the end. Um, you, you mentioned um, the, the the negotiation, I guess, or the action plan, but essentially it's it's going to be required as a, a negotiation from the nations going forward because. I see two issues. One is the consent, which you, you, you highlighted, which needs to be flushed out. And, and there's a lot of, lo lot of work on that. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just say that. Um, but, but the one I'm mostly concerned about is, is Article 3 and the impact Article 3 has within, uh, and again, you mentioned it, the Canadian Constitution. Um, so I, I guess that's uh, the other piece of the, the negotiation and, and, and that would be the advice I would give to council. Uh, and again, it's just my idea and my advice, you guys can do with it what you want, is, is the next stage on this is that negotiation and how that looks going forward um, and what that means for Six Nations um, and, and whether or not it's, it's even, uh, I guess we first need to do that analysis on, on whether or not it's uh, within our worthwhile to go forward on something like that vis-a-vis uh, -vis our, our land claim that we have going on, the negotiations that you're having, Chief. So um, I guess that's kind of um, where I'm coming from is let's look at it from the standpoint of where um, the law is situated now and where we want to go as a nation um, going forward. Uh, I think that's going to be important for us. But I look forward to reading the briefing note. Uh, and again, just to highlight my concerns, the consent piece uh, the articles around consent and, and then, you know, Article 3, um, the right to self-determination, how that's going to be impacted going forward as we go into, as you say, Christopher, that action plan or um, what I see as a negotiation phase. Thanks, Nathan. Yeah, and um, certainly over the next two years, there will be um, further developments and we'll find out how exactly the federal government plans to engage in those consultations and how they plan to take feedback like that into account as they develop that action plan. Yeah, exactly. And thank you. Uh, thank you, Christopher and Nathan uh, for, oh, sorry, Nate, did you have a follow-up question? And I'll, sh I'll head over to Audrey. I, I better not say what I was gonna say, but it's, <laughs> it's what the government's gonna do in the next two years. Yeah. And that's with, what with, that's, our, yeah. with our input. <laughs> right. Uh, okay. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nathan, for, for your comments. I'll look to Audrey, who uh, also had her hand raised. Audrey? Yeah, Christopher, I guess my, my question is, will we be sitting down together as a council and getting our position formed even before they ask for our input? So we'll be ready and have our position made before that time. Thank you. 
Yeah, and, and that's part of uh, what we want to in terms of moving forward as well as, is, you know, when Christopher obviously is, is highlighting these papers or, you know, briefings uh, to, to drop them in, in your Dropbox uh, as soon as possible again, and start to get to strategizing politically on some of these items. Uh, that's where we, we want to shift uh, Audrey as well. And, and I know Christopher, and uh, thanks Christopher for, uh, you know, looking to also joining the LLTF to, you know, assist in any political advocacy needed at that point in time as well. I know that's an important piece as well and recommendations coming back to full council. Uh, Helen had her hand up next. Yeah, I was going to say when you read Russell Diabo's summary of Bill C-15, it sounds a lot different from what Chris is saying. He raises a lot of concerns. I know right. a lot of people don't listen to him, but he does raise a lot of concerns with that. And I've read some of them and I kind of agree with some of them because I think it's, and I believe that's why the AIA, I was not, why they were opposed to that too, because yeah, it yeah. was affecting our inherent rights and our sovereignty and different things. And, uh, so and I think- his, 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 his take on it is, totally different because it doesn't it's not a good thing it isn't a good thing for us and i think it's important to highlight uh, those pieces of you know those position papers like diabos and so forth so that we can look to analyze you know what he's saying as well and i think that's where you know we've even created our position in supporting the ai ai when they're opposed to this and uh you know the different phases as it went through so again just looking to uh you know at this time provide this update but also look like audrey's alluded to creating our official position as to, right. yes. Okay, Christopher, again, I just wanna recognize the time. We are running a little bit behind, so if we can maybe speed up just a little bit more, yeah. back over to Christopher. Sure, okay, thanks. Um, and just on the concerns about C-15, there are some that are excerpted at length in the, in the paper too, uh, just because I figured that would do it more justice to provide some different perspectives on it. Um, next item, there was a, a question raised about um, the public service in the federal and provincial governments, uh, particularly how they operate and um, what the different positions are. Uh, again, there's a briefing note on this that goes into it in some depth. Um, it touches on deputy ministers and how uh, different deputy ministers are assigned to different ministries, how some ministries have multiple deputy ministers, how there are ADMs, directors general, managers, and so on. So that briefing note gives examples of uh, a couple individuals and shows their career progression. Um, but just to kind of cut to the chase, that at, at the end of the day, um, what the meaning of a particular title or position is depends on the ministry, the department, and the subject matter. Uh, so it's hard to give a sort of um, quick and easy rule uh, that can interpret a lot of that. For example, recently the chief's office was contacted on one file by a senior program manager responsible for policy planning and reporting in a particular branch of CERNAC, Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs Canada uh, Ministry. So um, long story short, it's complicated, but there's a lot more information in that briefing note and, uh, and certainly happy to answer any questions at any time. Uh, obviously anybody can call me anytime if they have any questions about that. Uh, finally, uh, election uh, preparation. Uh, given the last federal election took place in October 2019, the latest that the next federal election can take place is October 2023. However, we're currently in a minority parliament. Minority parliaments normally last between a year and a half to two years, which means right now we're right about uh, the average time for, uh, for such a parliament, which means everybody's expecting an imminent election call. Uh, the respective political parties have been speeding up putting all their candidates in place, as have their national campaign teams. Some party staff have been flying into Ottawa this week and, uh, and more will be flying in uh, on Friday of this week, anticipating a possible election call uh, either on Friday or on Sunday. Um, the Prime Minister held a campaign logistics discussion with media this week who will be covering his campaign. Um, local candidates across the country have been rapidly announced in recent days and, and out launching their campaigns. So the latest rumors are that the election will be called uh, this coming weekend. Um, the Canada Elections Act sets out a minimum writ period of 36 days and a maximum writ period of 50 days. So if the election is called on uh, Sunday, the election will be uh, at the earliest Monday, September 20th, could also be the following Monday or the Monday after that. 
Um, the rumors are that uh, local liberal campaigns have been instructed by Party HQ to rent out their campaign offices for the next two months, which would confirm those rumors. Um, also, so I think right now the most likely election dates are September 20th or September 27th, um, both of which are Mondays. Uh, there is a word out that NDP leader Jagmeet Singh had suggested that the new Governor General, Mary Simon, should deny the request of the Prime Minister to dissolve Parliament um, when he goes to visit her. Um, but the Governor General would not normally do so, and any such move would be uh, extremely controversial to say the least given that uh, this minority parliament has reached its sort of normal average tenure. Um, and one final note, just uh, out of interest, there are potentially two Six Nations candidates uh, running in this local riding, Brantford Brant, uh, Cole Squire and Alison McDonald. Um, and that's it for that update. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Christopher, for providing those updates. I'll look to any questions or comments on those last two items, Wendy. Yeah, so the writ drops. I mean, it was actually expected to drop last weekend. So if it comes out this weekend, I mean, the big thing is making sure that we've got our funding all tied up and that we've got the commitments we need. Because once a writ drops, I mean, there's no action, right? So right. just as long as we're situ just situated in a good position that way. Exactly. Yes. Good points and good comments. Thank you. Are there any further questions or comments for Christopher? Okay, so thank you again, Christopher, for providing uh, those political updates. Again, there are uh, additional materials that are dropped uh, within your Dropbox file folders, and I believe Tammy also just emailed out uh, even further material I've seen come up on our computer screen uh, in relation to just the uh, election speculation and so forth. Uh, we'll continue these updates and verbally uh, as much as we can and as much as business is going and so forth uh, and provide even further updates uh, in your drop boxes. So again, thank you, uh, Christopher, for providing those updates. Uh, with that being said, uh, Council, uh, that's all I have. We've taken care of the two additional new business items. Uh, one was Melba and she asked the question, which is when, in relation to the dental records, uh, the Indian Day School presentation, as well as uh, the Amy Miller issue from um, Councilor Michelle as well. Um, so that being said, uh, that, that's all we have for the open session of General Counsel. I will look now at this point for a motion to adjourn. Moved by Sherry Lynn, second by Michelle. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing on motions carried. Again, just want to say nyawa to our community for joining us this evening and looking forward to providing more updates and decisions as we move forward. Thank you. Take care. <laughs>